These are things I hear that could actually stop people from staying landlords. If you listen to advice and uh, it stops you from investing or it makes you do make poor choices when it comes to investing, how likely are you to keep an asset that isn't making any money? How likely are you to keep an asset that takes up a lot more of your time than you expected it to? I reached financial freedom by investing in buy and hold real estate. It took about eight years to become financially independent and bad debt free. I worked for four more years because I liked my job. And then I retired last year after 12 years of investing. I didn't have the best starting position. I found myself at 40, a single dad with three kids, uh, found out about $89,000 in bad debt in my name that I didn't know existed until the divorce. And if I listened to the advice that I hear some people give, I hate saying this out loud, I'd still be working. <laughs> and I'm way too lazy for that. Uh, it doesn't sound lazy when I talk about all the things that we need to do to reach financial freedom, but the motivation to reach financial freedom comes from the lazy. So one of the first things I hear people talk about when uh, advice to landlords, I'll hear people say, property taxes have increased, so you need to raise your rents. Or I'll hear people say, the cost of maintenance has gone up. Handymen, contractors, materials, it's costing more. So you need to raise your rents. My personal experience with homeowner insurance, uh, I've had about an 80% increase to the cost of my homeowner's insurance over the last, I want to say three years. Sounds significant. So the uneducated investor will say, well, if you had an 80% increase to one of your costs, you must raise the rent, right? Because increased costs get passed on to the customer. Technically, it's true, but if you're raising your rents based on your cost and you hear things uh, in the, the fear porn world of YouTube, uh, people say, my insurance has gone up 80%. That sounds significant. That's a big expense. Insurance sucks. We hate having insurance. We like it when we need it, but we don't like paying for it when we don't need it. And generally, with homeowner's insurance, you don't want to need it. I actually have the largest deductibles possible so that I'm less likely to make a claim because that could stop other insurers from insuring me for up to five years and triple my rates. But an 80% increase to my insurance cost on my duplexes made the annual price go from about $400 a year to seven or 500 to eight. So a three or $400 rent uh, increase to homeowner's insurance spread out over 12 months isn't even $100 a month. So when you hear about an expense going up, yeah, we're gonna raise the rents, but not because we have more expenses. If our expenses set the rents, a paid off property would rent for a lot less than a property with a mortgage, right? And if somebody's paying $1,000, $2,000 to a mortgage every month, they've got to rent for more than somebody who has a paid off property. That's not how it works. There's only one thing that tells us when to raise or lower our rents. And it isn't your expenses. It isn't inflation. I'm going to talk about that before I uh, get into the questions during the live stream aspect of this video. And I'm actually going to dispel a myth, a real estate myth that I'm going to dispel before I get to the questions. If you're watching this in future land, uh, this might be the version of the video that I chopped out and made a standalone video because not everybody's going to click on a two or three hour live stream but I want to get this information out to as many people as I can. More horrible advice that I hear people give to landlords is don't raise the rent. You could lose a good tenant. All right, if you don't raise the rent, you're gonna lose a good asset. And I have a solution to when it comes to raising the rent because that is something that most landlords struggle with, not most, a lot. Some struggle with it because they never do it. So like Graham Stephan, having 2022 rents or uh, tenants paying 2012 prices, right? For 10 years, he didn't raise the rents. So what did he do? Sold the assets because he can get a better return with the money sitting in a 
low interest savings account. This was done before interest in saving accounts started being four or five percent. So what sets rents? And the myth that I'm going to solve after I talk about what sets your rents is who pays the agents during a real estate transaction. So if you're watching this in, we haven't come up with a term for now, uh, you're not watching it in Futureland, but if you're here in the live chat, in the chat, I want to solve this myth. Who pays the agent fees? If you could do me a favor, put that into the chat, let me know. And then I want to talk about that in a minute. But here's what sets your rent. It's not your expenses. And more advice that I hear from people when it comes to investing that I hate hearing, because this is one of those ones that stops a landlord. If you raise your rents based on uh, your expenses going up, you probably are going to lose a good tenant. If you don't raise your rents based on expenses going up, you're probably going to lose a good asset. So this way is bad and this way is bad. There's a third option. I hear people telling new landlords that you need to have really good reserves and real estate is risky because expenses kill your cash flow. People say if you're cash flowing $200 a month on a property. So your cash flow means profit. So you take out your principal interest taxes and insurance and then your expenses. And then you set aside money for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. And then you set aside money for property management if you have it. What's left is your profit or your cash flow. We use cash flow because in uh, accounting terms, profit includes appreciation, principal pay down, like the, the profit that happened, um, but I'm talking cash flow. Cash flow is <laughs> dividend, Dave. Chuck Norris sets rents. I totally agree. Uh, <laughs> all my Chuck Norris jokes are inappropriate for this uh, format. But people will tell um, investors it's very risky. Don't do it because if you have a water heater that goes out and you have a thousand dollar expense to replace your water heater or a two thousand dollar but we're going to cut it in half it's only a thousand dollar and you're profiting two hundred dollars a month that means you lost five months of profit because you had that one expense i actually hear people say that or read people say that in the forums and then i will hear people say the crash bros of the world here's more horrible advice that you give to investors and landlords is whether you're just starting you own a bunch of properties you better wait because there's a real estate crash coming. You don't want to buy an asset that's going to lose value. And here's the reason every single day why there's a new crash coming. For over a decade, the crash bros have been screaming that there's a crash coming that isn't coming. We have literally built a fraction of the homes in the last decade than we did the decades before. Demand is high. Supply is low. We have a low supply uh, because a lot of people are in that real the, the uh mortgage interest rate trap, where in 2020, they were either purchasing properties with a 2 or 3% mortgage, or they were refinancing, like I did half my portfolio, to a under 3% mortgage. Hard to sell a property when values have gone up and interest rates have doubled. So we don't have the supply to make a crash. We don't have the toxic loans that happened in 2008. It wasn't prices that caused the crash. It was people borrowing more than they could. They financed 105% to wrap the closing costs up in the loan. They got ninja loans, so no income, no job, no assets, just told the bank how much they could borrow or how much they made. So the bank said how much they can borrow and it wasn't verified. And then we had adjustable rate mortgages because the lenders would say, well, you'll just be able to refinance if rates go up. And people couldn't. So we had a crash that had really not much to do with the price of property. So if you're being told to wait, that's horrible advice. If you're being told to hurry, right, prices are going to become unaffordable. The longer you wait, the uh, less likely you're even going to be able to buy property. If you're being told to hurry, I think it's bad advice. And if you're being told to wait, I think it's bad advice. So here's the solution to some of this bad advice. The first thing where the worst advice to me is taxes, insurance, cost of maintenance and repairs have gone up, so you better raise your rents. Your expenses don't set rents. Remember the example I started with, with uh, your mortgage. If you have a paid off mortgage, you better reduce your rent by 80%, right? Because you don't have that big expense. That's not how it works. The one metric that sets rents 
is area average rent. What are other like units in your area renting for as those increase or decrease your rent increases or decreases? And since we've started tracking the data in 1940, there has never been a five-year period where rents have once gone down market-wide. That's why you have to know your area average rents, area meaning your area, not market. Because there are times where the dot-com crash hit Silicon Valley really hard and their rents crash. The, the, the Detroit metal and manufacturing for cars moves away and their rents crash. So your local market can crash, which is one of the reasons why I suggest when we invest, we look for places with multiple economic drivers. Things like a base, a port, a college, a hospital, Boeing, Amazon, large population, an attraction that brings people in. So if somebody's telling you to raise your rents based on your expenses, you could price yourself out of rents and have a vacant unit if you're not paying attention to area average rents. This is why I came up with the binder strategy. If you don't raise rents, you're going to lose an asset because your expenses will outpace your income. So my solution to that is to have the tenants ask me to raise the rents so far, 100% of the time. And it's worked for, I want to say hundreds, but I know of actual dozens, the literal term dozens of people who've used the binder strategy and got their tenants to ask for a rent increase that was significantly more than what they were going to raise it themselves. I've even had a couple of people like Michelle, I see you here in the chat, and my friend Dan, who I had the binder strategy conversation with their tenant, and the tenant asked for a rent increase that was bigger, it was larger than the owner was comfortable with, so they recommended a smaller amount. That's how effective this can be. Happy tenants don't trash your property and happy tenants don't leave. So this is a way to raise your rents, not basing it off of your expenses because tenants don't care about that, but keeping up with your rents with expenses because when things cost more and there are tenant turnovers and people are doing new builds and people are doing rehabs, their expenses are so much that their rents are going to be higher, which is going to pull your rents up over time. If somebody is saying that you have an expense and it eats up your cash flow, I want you to understand this phrase, understand these words. Expenses do not impact cash flow. Seems counterintuitive, right? If, if, if you spend money, how does that not reduce your income? Well, that's because when I was talking about calculating the yield on a property, we said we pay the principal interest taxes and insurance. So those expenses we can see but we're also setting aside money for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. That's the money that covers the expenses. So in that first six months or maybe year of owning a property, it's gonna feel like it's coming out of your pocket because you might not have built the reserves up with that part of gross rents that you're setting aside. So in that first year, those repairs, maintenance, and vacancy expenses are actually a part of the cost to acquire. As you build up your reserves with the money from the tenants, I actually kind of look forward to it's really weird this year I had uh, some water heaters and refrigerators go out, which I hadn't in a decade, which is why I had them go out. Uh, I'm happy to replace them. My tenants paid over time for those repairs and I have new refrigerators and new water heaters that my tenants paid for and had no, literally zero impact on my cash flow. It protects my cash flow going forward. And then this horrible advice if you have somebody that says you need to, uh, hurry and buy because prices are going up and you're not going to be able to keep up or you need to wait and buy because there's a crash coming. When the investors who have reached financial freedom are saying there is no crash coming and the people who rent or live in their mom's basement are saying, here's all the reasons why there's a crash coming and you need to pay attention to my fear, but they're actually out there looking for properties in the markets they're saying they're going to crash. Here's the two things that tell you when to buy. It's not the market. It's not an impending crash. It's not inflation. The two things. The first is, are you ready? Right. This means there's nothing major going on in your life. Uh, you're not having a baby tomorrow. You're not going through a divorce. You're not. You're not suffering through a loss of somebody in your family. You don't have all of these things that are going that are such a point where it might eat up your mental bandwidth, so you don't have the ability to focus and make sure you're doing a good deal. That's the first thing. Are you ready? Whenever, not not whenever. Whenever I hear people say, are you ready? Most people think that you're talking. Do you have the down payment, closing costs, immediate repairs? Uh, do you have a good enough credit score? Like, are you ready? That all counts too. But are you emotionally and physically able to put the time, energy, and effort into making sure that you're acquiring a good deal? That's when you're ready. And the second thing is, 
did you find a great deal? And a great deal for me is a home is, is not a home run. It's a base hit. If you find a property that's not going to lose money, it's going to get a yield, maybe not a stellar 20, 30% return on your capital, but it's better than the average in your market. Without base hits, you're never going to get an RBI. I don't think any of my property purchases were ever home runs. They were good deals. And I tried to get the best deal I could, but when you are ready and you find a great deal, I believe you should be buying real estate. So area average rent set rents. The money you set aside covers expenses. <laughs> when you should buy has nothing to do with the market or an impending crash. In 2020, when a lot of the crash bros were saying, there's been, for the first time in my life, there's a pandemic that's shutting down the world. You have an eviction moratorium. People don't have to pay their rents. And uh, you can't evict tenants. Do you know how many people I talked to personally who told me not to buy? I actually found a duplex for sale that had about an 11% cash on cash return using a mortgage. Purchasing it, one across the street was for sale. So I reached out to some friends who wanted to get started. Now I was doing a 20, I think it was a 20 or 25% down, down payment. Normal, whatever I had found for a duplex at that point in time, not owner occupied. And I had the capital to acquire the one. And I told a friend who wanted to get started in real estate, look, this deal is good. I'm pouncing on it. You could pounce on the one across the street. Friends came and talked him out of it because there's an eviction moratorium going on. People don't have to pay the rents and you can't evict them. Who wouldn't like to buy a duplex right now at 2020 prices before the 21 or 24 and 19% appreciation we saw in my market in the last two years and before interest rates doubled? The place I purchased for 400,000 is close to six now. It's like a 580, 590 on appraisal. Uh, and I have 3% interest on the mortgage, right? See how my voice laughed there? Who wouldn't love to do that deal now? So imagine the people who lost money listening to the Crash Bros. I heard the Crash Bros. I interact with Crash Bros. Uh, I was ready. I found a great deal. Who pays for repairs? The tenants. What tells you when to buy? Are you ready? Did you find a deal? I want to dispel this myth. And I'm going to look at the chat to see who pays agent fees. And I'll see if I can look it up here. Uh, Frank Contreras, you said the seller, because that's that's uh, uh, every agent is going to tell you, don't worry, he's a buyer, seller pays it, th that. And um, you said the seller, uh, the wealth building journey says the buyer, uh, Michelle says the buyer, it's this, okay, and there you go. How do you, let's see, it depends if it's a seller or buyer market. So that's for the closing costs, yeah, but the agent fees. So the good good answer, I like that, uh, Laura. Yeah. When you purchase a property, the seller isn't paying for almost anything. The buyer is giving money to the seller. Now, if it's cash purchase, it goes to title and escrow. If it's a mortgage, the mortgage goes to title and escrow, and then the, the title company divvies up the funds wherever they're going. Most people will say the seller is paying the agent fees because the seller sees round numbers. You buy a million dollar property and the agents are going to get 3% each. So $60,000 is going to go to the agents. So the seller sees that title gets the million dollar mortgage or whatever the amount is that you're buying it for. And the seller basically has a million dollars. Then $60,000 goes to agents, which really goes to agents' taxes and agents' brokerage, and they get what's left. Then the title company takes care of any outstanding balances, any other mortgages that are still out there, set, takes the money out for taxes, the things like the, the what's it, fat, FERPTA tax or whatever, if it's a foreign investor, the title company handles that. So what's left, the seller gets. If you go to buy something seller financed, and in your head, you think the seller pays agent fees, you're going to shoot your deal on the foot. How many sellers do you think that want to do seller financing actually want to write a check? The reason I wanted to bring up this myth is because if you're making a seller finance offer, one of the first things you need to do is make sure that the agent or agents involved in the transaction, if they exist, 
understand that you are going to make sure they get paid, which means the down payment that you do has to be enough to cover the seller, uh, the seller's agent fees, right? If the seller wants a down payment of $50,000 to do whatever they're looking to do, but doesn't want the big capital gains hit of getting a million dollars all at once, and, and they want the consistent income, and, they, and you want to pay them interest instead of the bank, and you've pitched them with everything that's in my seller finance letter to get the person to want to do that, but the agents don't think they're going to get paid. They're going to tell the seller things like, you know, this is illegal. You can't do this. There are agents who think seller financing is illegal, or they use that as an excuse to make it not the way the seller goes. But if you alleviate that fear and you make sure the agents know my down payment is going to give the seller the whatever they need to cover what's left of their mortgage, give them the down payment that they look that they're looking for, whatever matters to them, and my down payment will cover the agent fees because I understand that even though almost everyone in real estate says the seller pays the agent fees, the money comes from the buyer. So that's. The myth dispelling for today, I have covered some of the worst advice uh, either this Thursday or next week. My live stream is going to be on the advice that I give that people hate the most. And I will cut this out right there. And that will be a video on its own someday. Let me get to the chat. The idea with a live stream is this is based on the questions that you ask. You might be one of those silent viewers who never asks a question, but somebody else is going to ask a question, which is going to make me cover a topic I might not have known to cover. And I used to, I used to, um, I, I hate conventions when you go to like a two or three day convention, if it's not a subject I'm, I'm very interested in. And while for a long time I, I ran a CDL school, I, I liked transportation, I liked higher education, I liked teaching people how to get a CDL and get a job. Uh, our actual tagline was be home every night. So we weren't like an over the road trucking uh, truck driver trainer. We were a local company, but I would go to these things. I was the president of the Northwest Career Colleges Federation. And it's 100, it, at the time it was 112 vocational schools, uh, you know, from welding and HVAC and, uh, I mean, there was operators union stuff. There was I mean, pretty much everything. Cosmetology was there. I'd go to conventions. And the first few, I never really learned as much during the presentations as I did during the conversations on the side. When I sat down with the, some CEO of ITT Tech and I was just like some truck driver trying to learn how to teach, uh, the conversations at that table is what I, where I learned the most. So my goal with these live streams is it's more like a conversation, right? Not a planned, scripted, here's my points, here's my counterpoints, thought out lesson plan with, you know, trying to keep it to three or less retainable facts presented in a format to, to be retained, right? I'm looking at, I'm not even sure what we're going to learn in this live stream until the questions come out. So I appreciate every single question that comes. I see that Bill O'Connell said hello all before Divin and Dave, which is not true. Divin and Dave was first today <laughs> and happy about it. I love that we've triggered uh, Dave's OCD and um, all piled onto it. Uh, the Wealth Building Journey checking out a property may or may not be on when the live starts. Awesome. Good luck. Let me know how it goes. Jason, that's on first day. Hello. Howdy, everybody. Ninja Vanish. Let's go. Lauren, hi from Tacoma. I am on the clock right now, but we'll listen in and participate as much as possible. Awesome. It's the best thing about the remote work is I think you can still be productive and have background something going on. Um, Michelle, howdy. I have a question. On what cameras and microphone you use for your videos? Um, make sure that this uh, sound is down. Why is this not going? This is where I usually look for the chat. Um, microphone is from Amazon. I just sent a link to somebody. I will put a link in the comments. Well, it's a boom mic with a pop filter, which I hope works. And uh, for the, the shorts that me and Millennial Mike do, I've got, I don't know where they are, Movo mics. Um, I'll put a link there for those two. The camera is a Logitech Brio. B-R-I-O uh, has a has an intro mic. I don't like it as much as the boom mic. I think the boom mic works better. 
Um, and just like when, when Zuber's mic doesn't work, if the computer mic picks it up, the sound is terrible. So every now and then I have to check Zoom to make sure I'm on the right mic. Um, at the new place, finally got the studio kind of half set up. Uh, I still don't have floors. I mean, it's physically floors. They're just, there's no flooring yet. Um, so we'll see how that week goes when that happens. Uh, microphone and camera, yeah. Pretty much, I've got another small mic that I used for the audiobook recording that I might put a link in there for too. It's more of a mobile thing, comes in a case. I don't think it's as good as this one. Jordan, howdy. Are you getting permits from the city to renovate? If so, is your city giving you the runaround like mine? So the, the contractors here that I'm finding, one of the filtering factors I'm using with the contractors that I reach out with, and there are two here right now who can probably hear me, I know one's working in the other room, um, have a good relationship with the city. And that was kind of my uh, litmus test of, of, yeah, price matters, right? I, I, I don't want to overpay. Reviews matter. Uh, conversation to pick up on their skills, to figure out if they, um, I want them to know more than me. I, I, everyone I hired at the CDL school when I was there, the president there, I was trying to find people who knew more than me. So I hired a lot of people. That was pretty easy. Uh, they're doing pretty good with the city. I had a dead tree removal that was very easy because I had, it was dead tree. My family does trees. So I, I knew the right language to use. Uh, the siding permit was super easy. The framing, uh, not so much. And that's not the permit problem. It's the structural engineer, designs, approval, back and forth. There's a wall to reframe. And then an interior wall I'm thinking of moving, but after reframing the outside, I might just not <laughs> do that. Total transparency. I talked about reaching financial freedom by, by buy and hold real estate. So there are some people here tonight who I have interacted with for a while and I consider actually friends. We've interacted in several different formats. Uh, and you know that I don't flip homes. I haven't done rehabs. I don't think a person starting out investing should start with the Burr method, especially when we've had a decade of an uptrending market with downtrending interest rates where you can totally screw up and the market covered your mistakes. We're not in that environment today. I'm doing a burr because I have reached financial freedom. I have retired. I don't have a tight timeline. I'm using self-funded um, strategies, so I don't have hard money with a timeline. Uh, the extra income from the other unit that I'm rehabbing would be nice, but not necessary for financial freedom. It's more of an advanced strategy that can happen later. And uh, when you start with it, I think it can add, if it doesn't go perfectly, it can add years, if not decades, to your investing. Kind of like Millennial Mike, you know, over eight units before he did his first burrs. While he was doing the two of his burrs, the interest rates doubled, but he had the portfolio and the skill set to handle it. Not so much on your first couple of deals. So it sucks with your city. Um, it's a human working in an office and you want to make their job as easy as possible. Do as much of their work for them as you can. Give them the justifiable things that they can take to their management whenever communicating. Try to do it through email because remember, a phone call, a conversation at the front desk, or a voicemail can be deleted or forgotten. But an email goes to the person and generally their chain of management. Best results come through email. Legacy, howdy, appreciate you too. Area average rents dictate rents. Exactly. To and fro global. Howdy. Probably missing some names here. For Milburn. Milburn. Howdy. <laughs> howdy. Any tips on, so this is buddies. Howdy. Any tips on where to store capital while searching for the next rental? Treasury bills or any other options? Thanks in advance. So the uh, electrician's back. If the power goes out, that's going to suck. Ooh, I didn't think of that. Huh. Is there a solution? No. I would lose Wi-Fi. If I all of a sudden go dark, I didn't die. <laughs> um. Where was I? I'm sorry. Squirrel. 
So for a long period of time, I tried to keep my money in a low interest uh, saving account. I wanted the scratch at the back of my mind, my lizard brain saying that money is losing money to, invel- to losing value to inflation, losing buying power. Uh, you want to find the next property to put it to work in. After financial freedom, I kind of looked for the higher interest paying accounts, but still was looking for the next property. I don't like the idea of tying up the money because an amazing deal could pop up tomorrow or in two years. So do you get the best return without getting a return on your capital while you're saving? No. If you were getting 4 or 5% interest, do you think that might take you pass on an 8% interest uh, return on your money deal in your area? When I've, I've given the math several times, I'm going to try to do this as abbreviated as possible. If you can get a 10% return on stocks and a 5% return on cash on cash return on real estate, I would take the 5% from real estate all day long because it's cash flow. The 10% from stocks is going to be taxed and you only get it if you actually sell the stocks. And dividend stocks don't pay 10%. The average is around 2.5%, right? So it's not the five to seven that you can get with some stocks sometimes that is also taxed. But the 5% is your cash flow. In an average year, you're going to get a 5% appreciation. We'll take out that the last two years were 24 and 19 in my market. Uh, So let's just say 5% a year, but that's on four times what you invested if you use leverage and you get principal pay down. And every time you purchase something, you start a new depreciation schedule to write off against income that you have. None of that happens with um, T-bills, what do you call it, CDs, stocks, none of that. So my preference was to put it in, there's a thing, there's a, there's a concept, and I forget what it was. Oh, remember in the middle of the night tonight. You want to be motivated to put the money to work in its best use, so I don't want to find an average use for it. Yeah, I loved your resume video from a while back. Is there any way to reach out for your help in beautifying mine? Simplify, simplify. You can. I might refer you to a placement specialist with the CDL school. Um, it, but you can you can send it to my email, which is in the chat. I will take a look and tell you what I think. I love the resume theory. It's actually it's the top three things that I did that uh, took the school I was working at from six staff to sixty uh, because of that resume theory. Uh, it solves a problem. If, you, if you're ever looking for work, here's the biggest mistake. Here is the mistake that every state and federal agency does wrong and every headhunting job placement agency does wrong. And I did it wrong in the beginning. And if you watched the resume video, you know what the mistake was. But those agencies and me in the beginning went to employers and we said, What do you want on a resume? What do you want on an application? What's your interview process like? Totally common sense, right? Go to the source, find out what they want. Employers want information that they use to eliminate you. Everything you've been told to put on your resume from your address, your, your education, your work history, your chronology, all of that will get you thrown in the trash. I accidentally asked the right question by mistake, figured out something that is kindergarten simple. I mean, literally a five-year-old can do it. And we got thousands of people jobs. HR, HR managers that watch the resume video hate me because it makes them irrelevant and it gets you past them. They are a filter to take the stack of resumes that they have down to the few that they're going to interview. And the resume theory that I teach on my resume video here on YouTube gets you past that. So glad it worked out. Feel free to send it to me and I'll tell you what I think. Laura, it depends if it's a seller's market or a buyer's market. Yes. So that's when you, who pays the closing fees. But if this, let's say the seller paid for everything, your appraisal, your inspection, your everything, that money is coming out of the money the buyer brings to the table. Might come from the lender, but it's still the buyer's committing to pay it back. Landlord Odyssey, howdy. What of your renovations will you be doing yourself? Um, some small electric work because it's legal in my area if you're the homeowner, and I mean small. Like, um, I normally would have hired a handyman for this, but I actually kind of wanted to see if I could do it without. Um, I was trying not to use too strong words. My stupidity being in the way. 
I put in the ceiling fan, which took going into the attic, putting in the brace, making it load bearing for ceiling fan and that kind of stuff. Um, normally I would totally just hire an electrician to have them do because I'm so lazy. Don't know why I wanted to do it. I did some paint. Um, yeah. I had a friend paint, help with the paint because uh, we were, you know, I was like moving stuff in. So I didn't want to do spray. We actually roll painted. And what else am I doing? I'm definitely not the guy that took out the big dead tree. <laughs> God, I'm not touching a chainsaw. I grew up the youngest of the brothers, joined the Marine Corps because tree work was so much harder than the Marine Corps would have been. And I was the youngest, which meant I was the manual labor. I was never, well, it's not never. I was often not the climber, not the faller. I was the cleanup person. Uh, so I'm not doing the trees, my the tree myself. It's already gone. What else? Is there anything else I'm doing myself? I did some demo. I'll do demo. Demo's fun. Because uh, I, you know, hard to break stuff when your goal is to break it. Uh, took a kitchen out of one and it was it was uh, tile with no hardy backer, just literally tile to drywall. So sledgehammer to drywall, sledgehammer to counter. Um, that's a good question. Buddy, is the binder strategy worked for me? Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Andy Borsch, howdy. What would you say if the tenant is firm about not raising the rent, even when we use the binder strategy on them? I've actually not seen that. And I've had people ask, what would you do if that was the case? So here is something, you know, if I, this, I don't know how this will translate to video, but I'm going to do this. This came up in a conversation with Dividend Dave. Um, I took a pen and I wish a darker pen would probably work, but I make a line. So I'm going to make it big. They have two lines. This is where the tenant's rent is now, right? So the, the, the follow-up to this question is, what if they suggest a small amount of increase, right? Then you're going to point out, this is where the rents are. So if they're at 1,000 or 1,100 and area average rents are 1,800, you're, you're literally going to use your hand like this on the pen and on a piece of paper. You can put your hands in the air and just give a visual. Some people aren't visual, and the numbers and math don't mean anything until they see it written out. And you say, I totally understand you want to keep your rent here. This is where you are now. And or maybe they want to do like a small increase. And you say, that does. I asked you what you thought was fair. That seems fair to you. But do you see how far you are away from where I would be if you moved out? And I don't want to kick you out. I don't want to make you move out. But this would be completely fair for me. So having that conversation, I've had tenants then go, oh, well, it makes more sense. And they'll try to be somewhere closer to theirs. But that's the solution to them not giving you a number. Now, here's the other thing to consider. Sometimes the best result is that they get out and you do a rehab, even if it's a light one. And then you get area average or above area average rents. You get to be the next one pushing the market. The goal, because of the lazy, is to not have to do a rehab, not to have to find screen, train another tenant and not make somebody move out of their house. But most investors, like the binder strategy is a finite number of people using this. There's like 600 people signed up for the course, which you can find at deontalk.com. It's free, right? There's no fee for the binder course. Um, but how many thousands and tens of thousands of landlords are setting the rents every month? Most times you buy a property, you tell the seller, look, I want, I want it vacant. Get everybody out so I can do what I want with the rents, right? So that's the most common thing. The solution with the binder strategy does a couple of things. Takes less of your time, gets a bigger increase than if you were just to acquire a property and do an increase yourself, it keeps happy tenants, and stops you from having to do a renovation, have months without a tenant, go through the permit process or whatever, however big the reno would be. Um, but it's not always the best solution. I actually had tenants about a year and a half ago, I was hoping left. Uh, they were in a, a I, I own a house and a duplex on this one property. Uh, it's what I call it my triplex, but really it's a house and a duplex. One of them is an ADU. And I wanted the people in the house to move out. Sorry if you guys are watching. I like you. But I wanted to try short-term rental or mid-term rentals. I haven't done that with my portfolio yet. And it's the one that's set up best for that. Water makes my eyes water.
I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Skull Vodka, who does not sponsor my videos, but they make them possible. I'm an introvert. <laughs> it takes a lot to get me to do this. I just want to get the information out. Uh, so, Andy, I hope that helps. Um, if you're going to do the binder strategy, send me an email. Say, this is what I'm looking at doing. And I'll tell you what I think. Dave, Dave. hi, landlord. There you go to landlord. Obviously, nice. Michelle, I see my chat moved, which I appreciate. It means that there's questions coming. I see Rob has arrived. I can start now. Um, wandering Doc. Hola. Como esta usted? From Medellin, Colombia. That is one of the places I didn't go. I was only there for a month, and that was one I missed. I didn't really do much in Bogota other than land. Um, but I wanted to see Medellin, too. But mostly I was there for scuba, which is more coastal. So, Lumberjack Landlord, howdy. Happy Tuesday. Jason, everyone put down your pens and hit that like button. Thank you. I appreciate that. Every time you hit the like button, someone retires before Matt. Uh, Dave, I'm an arc, a walking army of puns. Give it at least five minutes between dad jokes. There you go. Uh, I was trying to find where I was at. I think the last one I saw was Michelle. I see Andy Borsch took back a message to make me lose sleep tonight and wonder forever what was said. It's appreciated. Yep. And as far as I can tell, they're very happy. Awesome. Okay, here we go. David and Dave, the first rent increase amount since the binder strategy cleared. Rent is now 850 for one unit. Mortgage is 782. Life is good. Keep on building. I like those numbers. There's, there's more numbers to know, but I, I like those numbers there. Andy, since you only use one bank account for everything. Do you place your reserves and security deposits in a savings account or is everything in a checking account? So I have a, res a saving account. You have to know your local laws. I think uh, you're, you're required to keep your, your deposits in a separate account. So that's the one thing you have to know your local laws. Most places require that they're in a separate account. But my reserves, my most of my, well, so all my reserves and most of my investing fund goes into the saving account. The checking account keeps enough for probably three months worth of mortgages. And, uh, you know, probably not the, the full reserve right now is 50,000 because I'm retired. My reserves scaled with the growth of my portfolio. So when I had seven or less units, I had about 10,000. When I had 16 units, I raised it to 30. And then when I retired, I upped it to 50. Um, so that's just in the savings account. So it's a mental thing. That's money I shouldn't touch. Above that is what's being used for the business. Uh, landlord Odyssey, I would assume you raise the rent anyway. Yeah, you can just raise the rent anyway. Remember, the goal is to keep the tenant happy, but the goal is to buy side by side with a washer dryer and a, and a garage, like all these lists of things. It's the goal. Sometimes you adjust the goal. Update property I was looking at, this is wealth building journey up. Property I was looking at was insanely hot. As soon as my Agent and I were on the way out of the property. Another agent and an expecting couple were on their way in. Insanity is back. That's why I did a video this morning with um, Matt, the Lumberjack Landlord, and Zuber. It'll come out on Zuber's channel. On uh, Zuber's been doing this with all of his experts this, this week, and me and Matt concurred. 8% interest rates are good for the market. 5% would be horrible. A lot of people are saying, well, when the interest rates come down, I'm going to buy. Great. When the interest rates come down, imagine what's going to happen to prices. Josh, howdy. Uh, REI Stoners, off in time to make the meetup tonight and the live. I am so sorry I'm not going to make the meetup tonight. I have contractors here tonight, and I have to actually have an architect when I'm meeting. Um, I used to think when I owned the CDL school that I wanted to be a diesel mechanic because you get to charge so much to work on a truck. Now I'm thinking everybody should go to architect school. David and Dave, to wealth, have you thought about spreading vicious rumors about the property you want to buy? It's a strategy I'm working on. I have a tape of ghost sounds. You can borrow it if you want. I believe there is a mystery van with some teenagers and a great Dane looking for you right now, Dave. How 
Howdy, T. Jason, hello. I am going on a long boat key for three weeks. That looks like my phone call. I will pick that another time. I should go about finding. Um, I like the idea of investing in Sarasota. I should. How should I go about finding boots on the ground to build a team out there? Where I live in Chicago. So if you're going to build boots on the ground at a distance, I'd get involved in local REI meetups and try to get to know some of the investors. I think building the relationship with boots on the ground can take three to six months at a minimum. If you know of an investor who invests there, piggybacking on their team might speed that up a little. Uh, but it depends on their experience level there and their willingness to share their information with you. Uh, whenever picking a market, I've talked about this a few times, I think the most important metric is not crime, population growth, number of economic drivers, the yield you can get on every deal. Th those are all factors, but the most important one is those trusted boots on the ground. So that's the one I would start focusing on and develop before I really looked at anything else. I would want to know what makes you want to invest in Sarasota? Because I'm going to say something un unpopular. This is one of the things I might talk about next week when I say, when I give advice, people hate it. Here's the things I say that people hate. And I'm going to start with some really simple ones that don't tend to piss people off. And then I have some things that make people, uh, geez, the guys on Reddit want me to self-delete myself. Uh, and that's how bad they hate the advice that I give sometimes. But this one is in the middle. This doesn't cause the hate, but people disagree. If you're going to buy something like a vacation home in another state so that you can use it, that's not an investment. That's a purchase based on your needs, not your desire to grow. So what is making you want to reach into Sarasota and invest there? If it's the yield, the, your thought of the population, your growth, like if you've got justifiable, all these other factors, then take the time, energy, and effort to grow the boots on the ground. Local REI meetups can be virtual, can be Facebook, get to know the people in the area, find other investors. Wealth building journey. Could we discuss the pros and cons of loan products, excluding arms? So loan products. I probably need a little bit uh, more clarity because you have seller financing, hard money, portfolio loans, private money, FHA, conventional VA, owner occupied. Like there's like, that's a bit up there. But if you give me wealth building journey a little more narrowed down, I can cover the ones I prefer and the ones I would use. Zero to, zero to hero. I'm on the clock, but not remote work. Nice. I was a truck driver. I listened to tons of things while I was driving. I tried not to hit the, the uh, what do you call it, um, chat too much while I was driving. Dividend Dave, to buy more spiders and other creepy crawlies to make your basement into a scare b, &B for when I come to visit. <laughs> Just the basement. Hopefully people like that live where me and Mike went in there. I, was, I wasn't sure what to expect. I thought... Uh, there's part of a couch. There's a wheelchair. I can see a light on. This could be a whole room. It's not really a whole room. It is, well, it has a door. It's not quite livable space. I'm almost thinking elevated wine cellar, literally on an elevator, like a, um, one of those lift things. Thank you for the super chat, Dave. I appreciate it. It's much appreciated. There are some questions building up here tonight. Since I'm not making the Tacoma FI meetup, uh, I'm going to go a bit longer unless the um, architect guy shows up because at like $3 billion an hour, I'm probably not going to make him wait too long. Uh, Esther, howdy. It's good seeing you the other day in the members only live. That's interesting. The buyer actually pays for the agent fees. Yeah. Do the agents know it? They do. It's, it's really under, under life. The buyer doesn't buy the place. The seller's never going to pay the agent. They only pay the agent when the buyer brings money to the table that gets diverted from what the seller would get to the agents. So the agent should not be reluctant if it's a seller's finance. Not if you also tell them, my down payment is going to include the funds that will cover the agent fees because it's my goal to get you paid it actually use that those words. It is my goal to get you paid. I have an agent. He knows that's my goal. I want him to make money. 
because he brings me the next deal. <laughs> nice dad jokes, Dave. Jada, howdy. I'd like to get started in investing by the beaches in Florida, but I'm stuck in Georgia. I really don't see myself here in Georgia long term, but it's where my job is located. Would you advise for me to invest in Georgia for a while until I move to Florida, then invest there? If you're gonna, if you really want to self-manage, I would invest locally wherever you're at. I wouldn't start investing and self-managing at a distance. Um, study, I think you can study two markets. I wouldn't go to three or four. So I wouldn't pick like the beaches of Florida, but if you could find one in Florida, like I, I kind of did a market study last year for uh, my friends before I retired. I spent two months in Florida and I studied basically, um, what is it? Fort Myers, Cape Coral, the north end of Cape Coral is doubling in size. Um, so if you can find a market where you can focus, study your local market and study that one at a distance, look at your timeline. If you purchase properties where you are and you were there three or four years to build the systems, get the handyman in place, get the systems in place, and then move to Florida, I would be able to. So all my properties right now are, are around Tacoma and Olympia and Washington, not in those cities, but around those cities. If I was going to invest at a distance, I would uh, want property management. Since I invest locally, I property manage myself. If I move out of the area, I have the systems in place to continue self-managing, right? It's been years, probably five plus years since I have actually had a need where I would have to go to the property. I've gone to some properties, but I actually haven't had the need. So I could self-manage at a distance, but I wouldn't want to start self-managing at a distance before you have those systems in place. So if you're going to be there for three or four years and you have the ability to get the systems in place, and then when you move, you can actually keep those properties and just continue to self-manage at a distance, I would be okay with that. If you're going to move in six months to a year, I'd probably start looking at where you're going to end up. Uh, so timeline there is what matters. The wealth building journey, given in Dave, touche. I kind of walked into that one. That was the dad joke, yeah. Okay, Michelle, I will put the link in there. And, and if I forget, text me. <laughs> I'll remember then. Jason, everyone, that, that was a thing. I'll check. I forgot where I was at here. Snap temper. Howdy. I locked in a 2.75% 30-year fixed on my primary residence in California. I want to move out of California, but don't know if I should sell or rent out my home. What would you do? Uh, will it cash flow if you rent it out? Maybe would it cash flow with property management if you haven't been putting the systems in place of having handymen and people that you can have go handle issues when they pop up? Uh, where are you moving to? How much appreciation has there been? The deal, the market that you're going to, do you think you can find a deal that would cash flow? Um, if you're if you're moving, of course you're watching my channel. I'm going to suggest a house hack. Right? That's that's not the solution to everything. I think it was T. Adams that asked, well, what's the solution if we can't house hack? I'm going to do a video later this week on, if you don't house hack, what's this timeline? What changes that the three things that change the most if you don't put house hacking into your strategy? It's not everybody wants to. It's not that everybody can. I think everybody can. I don't care if you have a six-month-old baby. I had young kids too. You can house hack, but you don't want to. Jada. Yeah, I'm planning on being here for about four years. Thanks for the advice. Much love. Awesome. Yeah. So with the four years and the time to put in the, the systems, I'd invest locally. That would be my goal. Um, what part of California, if you're in Los Angeles County, I, I personally would probably sell. Uh, my brother owns in Kern County, good cash flowing rentals. I have a niece who's also purchased her first place in Kern County. Um, The other thing is, if you own a property in California and you decide to rent it out, so this is actually more personal advice, not advice, information that can help you. I can't tell you what to do. I can tell you what I would think. If you own a property in California and it is a single family house or a duplex, if it is in your personal name, it is not impacted by rent control. If you move it into an LLC, for any of the dumb reasons that a lot of people recommend you do that, which is on my list of advice that I give that people hate, it's on an end of the spectrum. Uh, then it's rent controlled. So maybe don't do that.
Uh, yeah, Rainy, I was thinking of connecting my phone for a hotspot, but I don't know. How, actually, at the end of this live, I may do that as a test to see how the service is. And then you guys might have, help me and give me feedback. And where's Mike? Was he shot out this week? I sent an invite. I don't know that he can always make it. He's been working a lot lately, which is for the overtime. Um, I believe the REI Avengers, Mike, uh, Millennial Mike, me and Matt are going to be together in Siberia, but at the right time of year, in a week and a half. Josh, watching you while traveling across country. Today I'm boating on Table Rock Lake near Branson. Nice. I want to do another month with my brothers across the country. Uh, you guys have uh, watched my video recently, if you've seen it, where I had my brother from California. Um, I want to get, take my brothers and go to, like, you know, all the three of us to, to travel together, Portugal, uh, Thailand, Colombia, wherever we're going to go. But I have one brother who doesn't fly because electronics don't work close to him. So we travel via truck and it didn't help. No matter how much you tell somebody, it'll be fine. Let's just fly. That when we started our month long across the country trip to just go see everywhere, the electric system in the truck completely failed for the first six days. And we were stuck in Twin Falls, Idaho. <laughs> so many jokes. Ninja Vanish. HR managers hate Dion for this one simple trick. They really do. Lumberjack, it's good to be the thermostat, not the thermometer. Life is a lot simpler when you figure out if you're the pin or the pin cushion. Uh, you see, Dividend Dave, my wife and kid are not here. I'm allowed to be more annoying with their hair. Um, Rob, have you been cured of your desire to do rehabs? Yes, this is a one and done. Uh, having Doing a rehab, there. How, I wonder how many potential investors I've interacted with who say things like, I want to do flips to get into real estate. No. <laughs> if it's just buy something and then all of a sudden ma magically a month later, it's worth $30,000 more, maybe. But if you're going to do rehabs, no. Josh, Dion puts the financial independence in December 5. Nice. <laughs> Investor wealth. Howdy. Wandering dog. I use the binder strategy with tenants in Hawaii. Have to say they pushed back quite a bit and settled on a slightly higher rent only if I did a bunch of repairs. Okay, so it's a negotiation. And then my chat moved. And then we placed uh, the other, you know, I got here. Kind of just tested it out for fun to see if it would work. It wasn't like I needed to do it. These are condos, HOA covers CapEx, so their units are very easy to self-manage. The other unit, one of the guys is a hothead and they agreed to a $150 increase in rent. I did 2,500 in tile work by the windows where there were termites. And then replaced faucets in multiple units. Honestly, all of these repairs needed to be done anyway. Rent boxes is, is a, akin to a buy box, I'm guessing. Rents in Hawaii were completely flat from 2015 to 2021. Believe it or not, only recently they started rising. Interesting. Yep. It's not a market I know. Uh, Hawaii, I know appreciation has been killer for the last probably decades. Um, but if rent's been flat that long, I think it was time for the binder strategy. And remember, Wandering Doc, sometimes, I haven't seen it yet, but sometimes the best result is if they just leave. Glover, howdy, Stephen, howdy. Uh, and Matt, thanks for answering my question a few lines ago about the unpermitted ADU. Zoning said it was unpermitted living space, so got to factor that in and need a variance. This is stressful. Yes, it is stressful. Uh, Matt, the, the walkthrough was amazing. Need to finish your course since it's I've been slacking. Nice. Uh, and Glover took back a message to also make me lose sleep tonight and wonder forever what was said. 
Stephen, the county I'm looking in to invest really needs one and two units for section eight. Nice. Um, the areas I'm in really needs three and four units, bedroom units. Ask Nurse Lauren. Howdy. I love the name. Are you doing one-on-one -on -one consultancy calls now? Saw that in the description box. I am. I've done a few. Um, and then I've done uh, some people who took the course one, the consultancy call. We just did one um, with me and Matt and the person. So that went really well. Again, thank you, Matt, for that. Even though I gave it away, or you know, the person won the hour. Yep. Uh, the consultancy calls are are fun. It's a really they're not recorded. They're not going to be released on YouTube. They're not going to be even in the members only. It's just freedom to speak in the gray areas where we need to during the consultancy calls. Um, so read between the lines if you need to. Uh, Rob, Dave runs a Halloween shop on the side. Wouldn't surprise me. Jason, thank you. I wanted to live on Longboat Key when I retire. I want to buy the rental property in Sar Sarasota to pay for that. I figured it would be a good way they were close by. So yeah, good good strategy. Uh, as long as you're not doing the thing where I said you're, you're buying it so you can use it. I think that's something some people try to justify, sometimes not getting a great deal. Clover, we just got our first tenant in our first rental property. Congratulations, 13%. Cap rate, thanks for all you guys. Uh, awesome. So is it cap rate or cash on cash return? Um, the, congratulations. That's awesome. The first, it, it's weird. I want to say, oh, when you get that first rent check, it's really cool. But when you get this in 10 years, 16, when you get the 734th rent check, it's still pretty cool. Jack, I love asking that question. It never exactly the same. Rob, the members only live on Saturday is interfering with my boat time. <laughs> well, it's there in future land too. I could try to do it later this week because I've got the course video, the course Zoom is at noon, Bigger Pockets uh, teaching assistant course is at two Pacific. So I could try to do maybe four. I want to say three, but I don't want to chop Bigger Pockets off at the hour, I'm trying to go longer sometimes. So if you're in the Breaker Pockets Bootcamp class and you hate it that I go over an hour, I'm sorry, you don't have to stay. I'm not insulted if you dip out. But a lot of good questions come in. Jason, great info on investing locally for self-management. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things most people don't realize is property managers make more on the property than the owner does in most cases. Burr Milburn. Probably seen it wrong. If you had 270 acres in Alabama that is paid off and also brings in a profit through timber, how would you use it to start investing? So if it brings in a profit through timber, I'd figure out how to optimize that. Is it Northwest is on a 21 year cycle. So figure out how many acres you can break up for whatever your cycle is there. Uh, little known fact, there are more trees in Washington state than there was in 1950. Farming timber is good for the environment. How would I use it? 270 acres and now there's paid off. So I don't, I'm not a fan of tapping equity, which means adding debt to an existing asset. But I would take the cash flow produced by the timber, use that to establish consistent income on tax returns. I would use it to save the down payment, closing costs, and immediate repairs for the next rental. I'm still me. I would house hack, which makes the down payment significantly smaller, gets you the best interest rate, and at least start one or two house hacks to get those properties going. Um, and then I would still, the same thing, have a 10-year plan to reach financial freedom. It can be done faster. I started off with $89,000 in bad debt I didn't know about, and I was only making $17 an hour when I started teaching people how to drive trucks. So I wasn't making a lot of money, had the bad debt to income ratio, and I planned out a 10-year path to make work optional. With that situation, I would still think of 10 years. Now, you might be a couple years into it if you already have the property, but that's how I would do it. I am not a fan of subdivide and sell. Now, you're losing part of your assets. Put debt, you're reducing the cash flow from the current income. Uh, yeah. So, again, sometimes the advice I give, it's on that spectrum. Nobody really hates it when I say don't do that, but there's a lot of people who disagree, and they say, well, you don't go so much faster if you 
you'll grow faster, you'll go faster, and you'll have thinner margins if you use the equity. Recycled capital gets you a bigger portfolio and after a longer period of time, better cash flow. But financial freedom in a shorter period of time from the least amount of units happens when you recycle cash flow, not capital. And then my chat moved. Howdy, Sam. And of course, dividend day for the dad joke. I hear burr strategies work good in Siberia. They do. Glover, can you house hack in a market with duplex selling at 2 million with rents at 3,500? Also, those duplexes are in C and D area. I would have to do the math on that. Um, so I would say I would use the CDS rental calculator app because I was really a big fan of it. But now every time I go to use it, there's an ad that pops up every five seconds. So I'm trying to find another calculator app that isn't as frustrating as that. Um, so 2 million, can you house hack? So conventional owner occupied on a duplex, find a lender that will do 5% down. FHA might have loan limits on this, the amount that they can go up to, which is different in each county. So they might qualify for 2 million there, which would give you 3.5% down. So 5% on 2 million, that's $100,000 that you need. Plus closing costs, money for immediate repairs and the reserves that they're going to require. You'd have to figure out no HOA, right? That's a deal killer for me. Uh, what are property taxes in that area? What will they be adjusted to after the sale? Because right now they're based on probably the last sale and then incremental increases over the years. And when you buy a property, you make a factual, tangible event that the assessor can look at and say, that's the new value. Uh, and then run to see if the yield is there. I think the more expensive the area, the more important house hacking is. Your income would dictate some my, in the, my area, when I house hacked that first duplex, I was still paying a portion of the mortgage. So it's possible that you would be paying a portion of the mortgage. But when we run the numbers on a house hack, we do two things to make sure it's a good deal. First, we take us out of the equation. If both units were rented, would the rents give me the yield I'm looking for? And if I did a big down payment, what would my return be? Like a 20 or 25%. In this case, maybe not so much, but if you were to use a VA loan, zero down, get in there, and you make a dollar a year, that's an infant return. Is that worth it for a dollar? Chandakala Summit, Atlanta. CK, no, it's not an acronym. How far is your farthest rental property that you self-manage? For a long period of time until this most recent purchase, everything was within an hour. I think now where I'm at, Farthest distance to the farthest away property, not quite an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 20 minutes. I think I would go up to two hours. I want to be able to go to a property to work for three or four hours if I ever had to in a day, right? So if you get past the two hour mark, that starts to be kind of hard to do. Um, but again, I'm self-managing because I know the area and I'm building systems. I'm about to go spend three months in Thailand. While I'm there, I will be self-managing. It's just as easy as if I'm here. I, I'm not going to the properties to do things. I think I'll have a tenant in place in this property. If not, I might uh, rent the place to the tenant who's going to be in that unit once it's done. Um, we'll see how that process goes. Look up, go twin, base jump next time. All right, yes, I want a base jump. It's the largest unpermitted base jump that I, know, I think in the US. Um, from Twin Falls there. I was really thinking about it last time I was there. I'm a fan of heights. When I got out of the Marines for a while, I worked as a windmill mechanic down in Tashby, California. Just like being up high, it's weird. I actually like being up high on man-made structures. My family being tree people, uh, tree surgeons, arborists, whatever you want to call them. Uh, I call them gypsies and they pissed. <laughs> um, I don't like being up in a tree because you can't see the rot. You can't see, yeah, none of that. Jada, I want to use your strategy, which is to buy properties that need little to no work done on it. As a beginner investor, what is the repair cap you have for a property that needs some work? 
If it exceeds the cap, is the deal worthwhile to pursue? In the beginning, the first, I want to say eight years, I passed anything that needed work. It was at the eight-year mark I bought the first property that needed a roof. And that wasn't even like it was going to take my time. It was three or four estimates, pay for the roof to be done. On average, when I acquired the properties in the beginning, I would spend less than two grand fixing them ready because they were I preferred occupied properties. There's already a tenant in place. So 2000 is to put in lights, you know, motion sensor, LED exterior lights, to put in coded locks, to maybe fix one or two small things that needed to be done, maybe replace a faucet or add a screen door or fix a ceiling fan, really simple stuff. That's pretty much what I hunted for. Um, and now after having done this rehab with no timeline, with no hard money, with all the freedom of financial independence and being retired, I am not doing this again. I didn't retire to create a job. And even talk, meeting with and talking to these kind of, I, I want to take my money, put it on a property with tenants in place, send a handyman to fix a couple simple things, use the binder strategy, and increase my income. As boring and unsexy as that sounds, financial freedom that comes from creating income that doesn't take a lot of work or effort is amazing. Lower annualized ROI is 25%. Well, there you go. Annualized. That usually means you're doing something short term. And if you say, I made this much profit in a period of time, but if I did this for the whole year, here's what the return would be. Wondering that, yeah, appreciation was good to us in Hawaii. I, yep. I locked in Hawaii since 1960. We've had 9% annualized year over year appreciation until today. It includes the downturns. Nice. Corby. Howdy, morning, evening, wherever you are. Joe D, howdy. How do you show the unit to prospective tenants? Do you use realtors or do you go show them the unit? So most times I do it. And whenever I'm listing a property, now this is the one thing where I'm absolutely going to step back and go, this is not the thing I'm professional at. My goal with my strategies is to buy properties that encourage limited tenant turnover. So I have side-by-side -side units instead of over-under, except for the most recent purchase, because you have less noise complaints. I want washer dryer hookups in the property because if somebody's using shared laundry or a laundromat, they are waiting for a place to open. I have at least two bedrooms and a garage because more space equals more stuff, so less likely to move. I allow pets because people don't like to relocate pets. Um, I have the criteria that I use to keep my tenant turnover to a minimum. So. Currently, I have 18 rental units, getting used to saying that. I had 16 up until a couple of weeks ago. Now I have 18 uh, total units. And I've had four tenant turnovers. One passed away, one inherited a house, one purchased a house, and one moved away. So I'm not like, this This is not my best advice, right? My, my, my advice is buy and hold, keeping tenants in place, getting the rents where you want them, keeping it to a minimum of time use on my part. But when I have a tenant turnover, the first couple I did through apartments.com. Uh, the first one was with Cozy, uh, which was a Canadian company, which was purchased by apartments.com. And uh, I went, if somebody paid for the application fee, right, those, those were free for the owner. And if somebody paid for the application fee, I would go and do a tour and show the property. There was one time since I have coded locks, I told the person, I had all their info, picture of driver's license, everything verified as much as I could. Here's the code to get in. And when my unit was vacant, I had an Arlo camera there. That's the current camera system I use at my place too. So I could see who was coming and going. And then I would just go change the code later. My last two tenant turnovers were through Hemling. So I started using Hemling a little over a year ago. I have three of my properties on there now. If the same thing. So Hemling puts it out onto 20 platforms. There are 30 platforms is the big difference. It's $28 a month plus $2 per unit for me. So currently I'm paying 30 something bucks a month to, to be able to do that. But I can collect rents on there, dispatch my handyman on there. And it's a three tiered system. So when I'm traveling to Thailand, I'm going to step up any month. If I have a tenant turnover while I'm gone, I can step up to tier three. And then they have a leasing agent that will go and do that. And Hamlin actually has a uh, self-guided tours option I might use, which is like the one I did, except they get a one-time use code for that person to use. Um, so that's how I'm doing that currently. If somebody, let, I haven't had this happen yet, but let's say there was a bunch of people who wanted to look at the property, but nobody paid for an application. 
I'm not going to schedule an appointment and go into the property and tour with somebody who hasn't paid for the application because that means that they, they've got money in the game. They're at least going to show up. But if I had a time where I didn't have people pay for the application, I usually have five to 10 applications paid for day one or two. What I would do then is I would do open house format. I would say Thursday from 3 to 6 p.m. I'm going to be at the property. If you want to see it, you're welcome to come by. There's going to be a bunch of other people there too, or Saturday or whatever day worked for me at the time. So without an application fee, open house format. If they pay an application fee, go for a tour. And so far only once, but in the future, if I'm traveling, it might be the self-guided tour where I use the one-time code. Rob, howdy. And the first two days do suck. Two years, exactly. Howdy, uh, JR. Howdy, how are you? Want my $2. Uh, there is a 1986 flashback for you. Jada, thanks, Dion. You're the best. Thank you. BF, hey now. <laughs> Glover, $2 million on home, 20% down would be $400,000. The mortgage payment after the tenant pays would be $3,500 work with 10 k I really don't see how house hacking would work in the Silicon Valley. Well, so let's say it won't work. But if you can find a place that you like to live that is a duplex and you're paying less than you would if you rented or purchased a place by yourself, you're just reducing your expenses. And if you're in Silicon Valley, what is the appreciation? What is the principal pay down? Right? What are the all of the things that go? What, how much of a depreciation schedule are you starting on that property that might impact your overall? Right? There's a ton of uh, things to look at there. And I do think the more expensive the area, although when you say Silicon Valley, that reminds me that you're in California. Leave. I wanted out. I was I was raised in LA, like northern LA, Palmdale, Lancaster, Acton, that Oakwood Dulce area. And uh I got out and I told my mom, if you want me to come to your funeral, you're gonna have to come to Washington to die. Uh, that's how much I didn't want to go back. I've been back a couple of times now. I still don't want to go. I was surprised at how clean Ventura is the last time I was there, though. And that was not what I was expecting. So if it's a $2 million home at 20% down, and those are the rents, if you could find something that's been on the market long enough, can you make a 1.8 or a 1.7 million offer? Right? Get that 10, 20, 30% off their price by watching something that sits on the market so long that their current asking price isn't what it gets. If things are going at 2 million off the market in less than 24 hours, no. But if it sits on the market for two or three months, now you start looking at making a lower offer. How do you use cameras at a rental property? Do you pay for internet at that location or share tenants internet? I've paid for the, the one time I had to do it. I just paid for the internet, turn it on, keep it there for a month. My utilities have what's called a landlord policy in place, right? So if a tenant moves out and turns their power off, power, water, all that just it reverts into my name so that my handyman and contractors have the, the you know, what they need to do any repairs and there's power if there's tenants that are applicants who are going to come by for a tour. So I just put the, the you need Wi-Fi hooked up, have a, have a router, have a, uh, I think I hardwired the, the base. Yeah, I don't even think I had a router. It was just the, um, have I told you about my memory issues? Sucks that I never know how many times I've said that in a video. Uh, in the router and you have the, the Wi-Fi modem. So just put the modem in, hardwire the base to the Arlo system there. Uh, and I usually do like three cameras, as I usually did at the one time, because I have at where I'm at five cameras. Uh, and at the rental, I just had three. I just wanted to see points of egress. Um, and what else did I look at? Um, there was a reason for the third camera on the kitchen. Don't know why. That's just where I wanted it. Joe D. Howdy. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. Um, what do you think about properties with septic tanks? Searching for a second rental in Florida. These are some pretty good deals, but they have septic tank. It's kind of a turn off for me. So I'm in the other side of the spectrum. My portfolio is about, well, now it's about, no, it's 50-50 four septics, four city sewer. 
I wish I had eight septic systems, period. I have spent tens, multiple, probably coming up on six figures on sewer. And if there's a plumbing problem with the pipes, it's it's going to be on my side of the line. Uh, my life's septic. I've spent total in over a decade. I, I want to think I broke $1,000 compared to $100,000. 1000 or 100000 having septic versus sewer. Um, yeah. Yeah, septic all the way. Here's the limiting factor factor with septic that can suck. The one biggest negative, it's not the repairs, it's not the maintenance. Sewer's just as expensive to maintain. Um, you, you might have a septic system that goes out and spend, let's 50 grand replacing one. It's probably gonna be 10 or 20, right? But let's say 50. That's still half what I've spent on sewer over the same time period. Half. If the whole system failed, um, this is one that gets me <laughs> it's frustrating. I hate my properties that are on sewer. I hate that the one I just bought is on sewer, except for this one thing. This should be a video by itself. Septic systems are limited to bedroom count. Sewer, not so much. So if you buy a duplex and it has two bedrooms and a family room on each side, you're going to rent that as a three bedroom. You're going to put it in a door, in a closet. You're going to rent it. You're going to have a three-bedroom rental. But if you go to sell it, here's the negative. That's a two-bedroom. It's going to appraise for a two-bedroom. It's going to be listed as a two-bedroom. You can put family room, bonus room, den, whatever, but it isn't a third bedroom because the septic system is permitted for that many bedrooms. That's the negative. Uh, yeah, so now you know my preference. Rainy, the duplex, I hope you're not working today, testing. It's kind of cool to see you in the members live and see Ray. I haven't seen Ray in, I want to say, a couple of years. The duplexes around Tacoma area are more than 600,000 now. It's beautiful, especially when you bought them at 300,000. Sorry, segue there. How would you go about looking for a deal when the projected mortgage is at 4,000 plus? So prices have doubled in the last four years. Interest rates have doubled in the last year. It's really hard. So here's the metric that changed, Rainy. From 2015 to 2021, yeah, 2021, speed was it. You wanted an offer in before the seller realized they were going to get inundated with offers. Well, now speed's not the metric you want to watch. So the, the, the property that I just purchased, and I want to kind of, kind of break down. I, I did expand my market out. I included Port Orchard, Mason County. So Kitsap and Mason County. You might want to look at Gig Harbor, Milton. Like expand your circle out a little bit. Stay out of King County. I want to do that because I know Rainy and he's close to me. Um, watch days on market. This property that I'm in was on market over 100 days. It's, it's ARV if it was repaired is over 750, right? So this is Port Orchard, right on the water, two... Uh, lower and upper units, full wraparound decks, water view, both sides, right? So this is AR, AR, and I'm being really low. Everyone I've talked to puts it at the, at the million mark, but I'm saying ARV 750. They originally listed at 500 because it needs a bunch of work um, and, and has some issues. So I offer four because it sat on the market for 100 days. So if you find one that's at six plus, and it's been on the market for a while, um, I found another one in Shelton. It was listed at 414, and it made sense at 390. We made the 390 offer, was accepted, and then backed out because this one went through. Uh, so 390 in Shelton, both sides would rent 2,000 all day long. So I ran the numbers at 18. It made sense. Uh, watch days on market, make low offers, maybe expand your market like I did. That's what I would be doing now. Uh, I wouldn't. Think, well, if I did short-term rentals or if I rented by the room, then blah, 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 reason makes the numbers work. Short-term rentals can go away at any time. Ask everybody in that part of Texas and Vegas that just had short-term rentals taken away. Uh, renting by the room seems all right, but there are some municipalities who might have that law that says only three unrelated adults can reside in a premises. 
so I, I wouldn't take anything like that. If you're going to use those strategies, find one that at least makes sense long term and then benefit from those other more advanced strategies while you can, but be ready for them to go away and not be stuck with a property that loses money and wouldn't be able to sell because you might have overpaid because you're using those two strategies. Aaron, howdy. Back in South Dakota. I haven't heard from you in a while. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Julie, how do you pick a company to take four big trees down? <laughs> so many estimates. You're going to want at least four, right? At least four. So I went to Thumbtack and um, shoot, my, my family doesn't watch this far into a video. My family being tree trimmers, owning companies, being arborists, um, would laugh if they know that I don't want to do my own trees. So I just took out a big dead tree here and had another one trimmed. Talked to, uh, hand, went on, went on Thumbtack got to get some estimates. And I talked to a handyman who has, you know, an electrician, a plumber, or whatever. So he's got like a handyman with subs, right? So it's a good resource to have. Well, he said, I've got a tree guy. He'll go by and give you an estimate. So for the two trees here, one was, a, you know, they're 80 foot and dead. Um, and one is probably 80 to 90 and by power lines. Find them on a hill. So it kind of looks dangerous, but I did trees. Here's how you estimate it. Dead tree, we take two guys, climber and a cleanup, and for safety, four hours, right? Hour of the rate, two guys, travel time, blah, blah, blah. I'd come up with high end, $1,000, low end, 500 bucks. So it's a 500 point, $500 spread. This is how I'd estimate the removal of that. The trimming the tree, I went through all the same thing, the same metrics, what it would take to do it. So I came up in my head, if, it, if I can estimate between 500 and 1,000, that's my range. First guy out here, Drives by the property, sends an email, four grand. He did not use his services. Uh, talked to two more. I got a twelve hundred estimate, and then then and all of the trimmers that I talked to in the area told me avoid. And here's a plug, shameless plug. I'm not sponsored by them. Olympic View Tree Service in Port Orchard. The other arborists said to avoid them because their prices are too high. Well, I bring them out here and I'm talking to the guy and he basically goes, yeah, two guys, about four hours, probably going to be like uh, 650 for that tree, 150 for that tree, well, 800 bucks, we do it both. They got the work. Awesome crew, super professional, great cleanup. They were safe. They And, and I want to say they did it the way we did, probably did it better than the way my family would have done it. So having arborist experience, seeing them show up. So if you're in the Kitsap um, County area, Olympic View Tree Service. I highly recommend. Great price, great service. Knew what the heck they were doing. Told me exactly who to talk to at the city um, uh, to, to go in for if there was a permitting process for the tree. The verbiage to use, which I kind of knew, but it's nice to have to know what the local, um, I don't want to call them Gestapo, but it's whatever the municipality wants to call themselves, what they want to hear to get the job done. So that's what I would do, Julie. Go to Thumbtack get at least three or four estimates. Don't make a decision until you talk to all of them. Kind of share between them. You know, this is the estimate I'm getting from the other guy. What are your thoughts on that? Just like I do with lenders, just like I did if I was going to have, uh, you know, talk to all of the contractors here on the, the one wall reframing that we're um, figuring out because of some rot and the siding and all that, I did the same thing. It's no different for trees than it is to do like carpentry work. That's what I would do. Ask the question when you have the trees brought down, Julie. Uh, do they charge for hallway? So you're going to probably want the limbs and brush cleaned up, right? But the wood itself, if they charge you to haul it away, uh, I wouldn't pay for that. For free, most arborists will chop the wood into 16-inch lengths, and then you just leave it out there. And in the magical world of Washington, it's gone. Unless you've left Washington. I don't know if you've moved. Uh, but that's how it works here. It, it, the people who use wood will come and take it off your lawn. They just, they know if it's out there and there's nothing that says, you know, uh, keep out or whatever. That wood on the ground is basically to be hauled away. So that's what I did with mine, except I called somebody who I know used wood. I told them when the tree was being brought down, um, have the wood hauled away would it cost an amount. Have the wood chopped into 16 or cut into 16 inch lengths was no extra charge. And they took the wood. Ciao, Stephen. 
How do you find a good handyman and how do you handle emergency calls during non-business hours? So here's the two questions. And I want to make sure I get to both of them. The first one is how do you find a good handyman? Um, reviews from other investors. So if you go to local REI meetups and you get a face-to-face -face review of handyman, um, some people want to hold it close to the vest and not share. And the opposite, I want to share my handyman, contractors, agents, anybody I've had a good experience with, I want them to get more work so that they're, they want to work with me in the future. But um, if you can find investors who will share this is who we use, and then you want to find out what are their specialties, right? I, I've got a handyman who will do uh, LVP, painting, uh, banister work, uh, but he doesn't do carpet. This guy just hates carpet, doesn't want to touch it. So I know that about him. So keep him over here. I want to keep two or three handymen. And so here's how I am. I built the list of handymen for the new market that I've expanded into. Went on Thumbtack and I hired somebody for uh, siding removal, uh, bathroom demo, uh, a couple of other things. So a couple of handymen come out. How did they interact with me? What were their prices like? Were they very clear? Did they tell me what their limitations were? Did they know when to recommend, hey, that's something an electrician has to do or something you can do yourself? That kind of stuff. So interact with them and then figure out, okay, these are the people I like. This is, in my experience, here out here in uh, Port Orchard, the one guy I'm not going to work with, up to is a contractor who thinks I'm a billionaire and uh, <laughs> an handyman that, um, yeah, I don't know, there's a reason. Is a handyman, but so those two are kind of eliminated, and the, the others I have great experiences. So I will be sharing when projects are done. Here's who you should use in this area, right? But here's what I like to do. So that's the first thing. How do I find them? other investors for recommendations? And then I would go on Thumbtack because I don't know investors in this area, and I'm I'm already missing my own local REA meetup in Tacoma, but so I wasn't going to any out here. Uh, I'll stop calling out here after I've lived here for a while, but. Uh, I would go to Thumbtack, hire somebody for these small jobs, interact with them, and then find out what their skill sets are. I've got a handyman who was, all, was a plumber for years, so he's got like that. He's got subs for a couple of different things. So build the relationship. And then my goal is to hire them for things I could do. And I'm not going to talk very loud. There is an electrician in the other room who I have doing something I could do myself. But I want to see the price, the timeline, the professionalism, how he interacts with when he parks around my house, if any of the neighbors interact with him, and what is my experience like? Because in a month or two, I'm probably going to be replacing electric panels. I want to know what the experience is like. So I'm building those relationships here on small jobs that I could do myself. And so that's how I found and find and vet them in the beginning, how I keep them and how I avoid the second part of your question. How do I handle calls that are late at night to alleviate a lot of the stress early on? Um, take a your own little handy trusty binder thing and Google in your area and call to make sure that it is a current company that's working that does just don't have an old website. 24 hour plumber emergency service have two or three of them numbers written down emails written down. Uh, seven day a week emergency service electrician don't need 24 hours for that but I need seven day a week I need to be able to go out on a Saturday or Sunday uh, but I don't need them at midnight to be able to handle something like heating or or air conditioning or or no power have those lists pre-built the first couple of times that a tenant interacts with a handyman I'm involved it's like hey this person meet my handyman his name is David, his name is Jeremy, his name is whatever. I'm going to introduce you. They're going to come and fix the problem with your dishwasher. They're going to come and fix the whatever, right? After that one or two interactions with the tenant, I kind of get a feel from the tenant how the interactions went. These are handymen I've worked with several times in trust. I'm not involved with the 10 o'clock at night call, right? It's an email or a text that hits the group chat for me and the handyman. And then I watch the handyman handles the issue, goes out, clears the clog, goes out what was the last thing it's a late night call water heater leak goes out handles the leak takes care of it to the point where i had to do the, the 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 bigger repair but those late night calls are handled mostly by your handyman that's why i talk about your everybody talks about building a team and your your agent and your lender and your blah 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 no 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 
you date your agents, you date your lenders, you marry the property. And for your property, what you need is good relationships with handymen if you're going to self-manage. So to get them to answer the 10 or 11 o'clock at night text, I give them a threshold. Anything $500 or less, you can pretty much just do and then bill me. Anything you have to buy materials for or it's going to be more than $500, you need to reach out to me. So I built that level of trust. But then I'll have something like a tenant calls and says, this little thing needs fixed. And I could completely go and do the thing by myself. I call the handyman. I give them an easy job. And I pay them well. And I tip them. They are more likely to then be okay with the difficult or crawl in the crawl space job or the late night call job because they know I'm treating them right. On the easy jobs, I could totally go do myself, save a bunch of money. And whenever we save money by doing something we could have had the handyman do, we're taking money from them. So if you have an easy job and we tell them, look, this is an easy job, I can go do it myself. I want to give you the opportunity to make money before I do. Part of that, me being lazy, but part is to build that relationship so that the handyman is likely to answer the call at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. JD, Joe D, thanks. A video about septic will be great. Yeah, thank you. I will tell you. Try to do that. Randy just finished testing, no passes. Leak, not a good day. It's, it's funny, I can say this now because I do not work at the school anymore. I have a feeling, knowing you, that you had people who failed. There are testers who show up in a bad mood, and their mood makes everyone fail that day. The one we had the biggest trouble with no longer works there. Aaron, howdy. Doing very well, and I am temporarily moving to North Carolina for almost 10 months at the end of the month. Nice. Oh, cool. Good. Delbert, howdy. How long do you keep a property to stabilize it to get it cash flowing? Up until this property that I'm in right now, day one. The properties I've purchased have tenants in place. Uh, they got a yield before the binder strategy. They got a, the yield I wanted after the binder strategy. Uh, so I've never purchased a property that uh, up until this purchase. I've just did a purchase, which is really a house hack, but it's a self-funded burr. So it's, it's probably not going to cash flow for six months, maybe. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to refinance out for the bird because I don't need to. But this is where I'm really careful to say, don't compare year 12 to year one. I'm not in growth phase. I'm not trying to recycle any of this capital. My purchases to reach financial freedom was I, I preferred to buy rent ready or already occupied properties. And, and here's, the, here's the quick numbers breakdown to let you know how fast you can cash flow. I always want you to have a good reserve. You can use retirement accounts as a reserve, but it would be better if you had cash because things are going to pop up. I had seven rentals, seven rental units, and they paid off property and was buying a fourplex. So I was making $2,700 a month in cash flow or something like that and was buying my fourplex. It took me down to about $200 in my account. I had to use my reserve, my retirement account as a reserve. And then in my mind, I had about $17,000 on the credit card I hadn't used. I could tap the retirement account if I needed to. So I don't recommend ever going down that close. But I was buying the fourplex. It's a house hack that's worth over a million now that I was paying $590 for. It was a ridiculously low value price on a property because it needed a roof. People couldn't get financing. I figured out how to do that. And I bought the property. January 6, 2020, we close. I have $200 in my account. Now, I get the cash flow for from January 6th to the end of the month, the rents from the property. I get that at the closing table. So while my account went down to $200, I instantly got four units worth of rent for prorated for what was 25 days of the month that was remaining 24, whatever the math is. Um, so that check came in. And then on the first, I still had a W-2. So I got paid in the middle of the month, paid on the first. Um, the rents from the uh, seven units and then the rents from three of the four because I had uh, done cash for keys to get the person out of the unit that I was moving into. By February 1st, I had over 10 grand in my account because I knew the cash flow was there. 
So it was stabilized when I purchased it. That's the the way I like to buy my properties. I don't do rehabs. I'm doing this one on this self-funded burr as a, let me do this. It's going to make some great videos. It will be a good deal in a couple of years. And it is an absolute reminder why I don't do this. Um, Michael, howdy. Jody, Dion, you have a million dollars view in your haunted house. I thought that's two million dollar views and is haunted. Oh, you're pretty handy, Dave. MK, use two of your techniques this week. High yield savings account interest paid for my first issue with electrical issues. Nice. The electrician from Thumbtack. Dion and Lumberjack Landlord really do tell you need to know. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. That's really cool. JR, howdy. What types of masonry issues would you take on to fix versus pass and why when considering putting an offer in or not? So most of my purchases, if I couldn't be in the property or have the property rented out without spending less than $2,000, I passed. I finally bought the fourplex that needed a roof. So it was the first one that had a big expense. This burr, I'm trying to think what would have stopped me. I am having foundation work done. I'm having reframing work done. I'm having siding work done, electrical, plumbing. If the yield is there, so what is the ARV? What is the rents versus the purchase price versus the cost to make it rent ready? So it's not so much of what type. I hear people say, well, I would never touch anything that has foundation, foundation issues. Foundation work's actually not that expensive. You just have to find the contractor that does foundation work. So I haven't found anything yet that's a deal breaker. I would look at the cost, the estimated cost. And here's, I did a walkthrough on the property that I'm purchasing with a contractor. Uh, gave me you know, some pretty good ideas on what we needed to do, what we didn't need to do. Said around 30 grand. So I figured he meant 50 and then I budgeted 80, right? The goal is 30, but I've got close to tripling that in the actual plan of what's probably going to happen. Because I could easily put a hundred thousand into this and still have a good ARV that justified the purchase price and the hundred thousand. I think if I get to the 150, I start to being an average deal. And if I spend 200, then it's like a deal where I break even. Uh, Chenda Kela Samita Atlanta LLC or umbrella policy to protect yourself. I see Rob put in a message and took it back because he probably realized Chenda, you, you might be new to the channel. Um, I see you followed up with what's the best way to hide a rental property owner's identity. Currently I am using a PO box address. Any other suggestions? Okay. So you have a, kind of real uh, reason as to why you want to hide the, own, the ownership. I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I tell everybody. I tell everybody where I live. Um, 37 guns in my house pointed at everything and a security system with cameras, so come on by, but announce yourself first. Um, what was that? Sorry, squirrel. So the LLC versus uh, umbrella policy. First, separate those completely because there is absolutely no L, uh, asset protection with an LLC, unless you have partners. So if you wanna go, should I have an umbrella policy or an LLC for asset protection, and you don't have partners, that's like saying, should I have an umbrella policy or buy coffee for asset protection? So I'm gonna keep this as abbreviated as possible. I, I um, and, and, and before anybody says anything in the chat, please don't say anything negative to Chanda, that they, they are, you are probably new to the channel. I have a really big problem with the, because this question comes up, right? You know, when should I have an LLC? How would I do an LLC? Should I have an umbrella or an LLC? It's, it's a very smart question. You should start with it because what, what's everybody else doing? What's the most recommended thing, right? My problem is brand new investors get stopped in their tracks on something that doesn't matter. So first, the idea of an LLC for tax benefits, there are none. 
In 1996, the IRS made a determination that all sole proprietor LLCs are called disregarded entities. They don't exist. So no tax benefits. When it comes to asset protection, if you have a partner, the purpose of an LLC, a limited liability company, meaning more than one person, it is a company of people, it protects you from someone else's mistakes. When you are sued, your assets are at risk and every one of your LLCs is your asset. Uh, so it doesn't separate your things. Uh, more federal judges are doing what's called piercing the veil. And they can very easily find a way if you commingled finances or didn't structure it right or anything like that. Well, the counties where I invest, they disregard them. They take that 1996 IRS precedence and say, all single member LLCs don't exist. They are disregarded entities. So you don't even have to pierce the veil here. They just don't give you any asset protection. So if the question is umbrella policy or LLC, LLC does nothing for you unless you have partners. I have an umbrella policy. I probably should have got it when I had three properties. I got it when I had four. So I picked it up a little bit late. When your assets are large enough to where if a lawsuit hit you, you could lose more than one or two properties, I would get the umbrella policy. And I'll explain that. There's three forms of asset protection that I do use. LLC is not part of it. There's actually a long list of reasons why the LLC doesn't happen for me. One, higher interest rates. Can't house hack. Insurance costs more more likely to be sued because companies have deep, deeper pockets and people think they can sue them and make more money. In California and some other states, if a property is in your name, rent control doesn't hit it. But if you put a property in an LLC, now it's rent controlled. Like there's a long list of reasons why LLCs suck. Christian and Cody, first thing Christian did is put his property into an LLC. Then he wanted to re recycle capital and refinance it. And they said, can't do it in an LLC. You got to pull it out first. So the cost of putting it in, the cost of taking it out to do that it was a barrier to him using the money. Three forms of asset protection that I do use. One, insurance. So you have property insurance on every property uh, that covers the full replacement value of the property, not just the mortgage, right? You want to be made whole, not just the lender. And uh, normal seems to be $300,000 in slip, fall, or injury coverage on each property. Once you have like three or more properties, this is where I would get the umbrella. I have $2 million in coverage. When I got it, it was 50, uh, $550 a year. And now it's like 680 or something. That's the one that hasn't gone up. Most of my property insurances have gone up from 400 to 500 a month, to eight to 900 a month. But the umbrella policy went up a little over 100. That kicks in if an, a lawsuit goes above the 300000 that's on the property. You might also need to have your vehicle insurance through the same provider, and they make you step up the coverage. And for me on my vehicle, it was a significantly higher amount of coverage that they required, which cost me $6 a year for that change. So it was a ridiculously small amount for a large amount of coverage to be able to qualify for the umbrella policy. That's the first thing. Second thing is leverage. Six of my eight properties have mortgages on them. Bank's in first position. They're not taking the property from me. Third thing, and this is the most important, this is where asset protection comes from. Fix things. Be proactive. Have handyman or you do tours. Anytime a tenant has a complaint, if it's anything safety issue related, you are very timely. Get it done as quick as possible. Um, so that's asset protection. Now, now, the idea of how do I hide from the tenants that I'm the owner maybe you have a reason. I don't know what it is. I want my tenants to know. I want them to know that I'm a human. I own the properties. We agreed, we made a contract that you will pay the rent on time. You will keep the place clean. You won't have raging parties that get noise complaints. You won't trash the property. I agree to fix things, right? That's, that's the social contract we have. That is the legal paper documented contract that we have. My name is on there. If you want to use a property manager, that's probably the easiest way to conceal who the actual owner is. Everything goes through the property manager. If you're self-managing and you go through an LLC, it's still going to be your name on everything. You're still going to be signing leases. You're still going to be interacting with them. The handyman isn't going to say, best properties LLC says I can do this. They're going to say, Stephen said I should come and fix the fan or whatever you're, they're doing, right? They're, they're, they're going to know unless you go through property management. So if you're going to do that, Give up more than half of your profits to a property manager because that's about what you do. Uh, so I have a long list of reasons why I don't use an LLC, why I do use a, a uh, umbrella policy. And a lot of times when the question comes up in the chat in these live streams, I'm, I'm very glad that it came up kind of this far in 
because I get a, a bit of a rant. And, and if you have 10 properties and you're like, well, I decided to get some LLCs and you have cash flow that you can literally throw away for no benefit whatsoever, sure, go for it. But the new investor that doesn't have a property yet, that's like, how do I pay myself? What do I name it? What do you mean I can't get financing and half sack this property in an LLC? Like all the things that the LLC just stops them from doing, that's where I get um, animated about it. There are times having an LLC makes sense. If you have partners, you want an LLC. If you need to use hard money or sometimes commercial loans will require an LLC. If you want to hide your name, maybe it can work, but I think property management is the only way that you're really going to be able to do that with, to put that barrier between you and tenants. I kind of want my tenants to know that it's me. This is a great question and it does come up often. So I'm, I'm thank you for asking that question because there might be somebody else who's new to the channel that didn't know any of that because most people just hear the person who's never owned a rental property on the Choose FI Facebook group going, well, if you're going to buy properties, you're at a really big risk. You better put it in an LLC for asset protection and tax benefits. And somehow they sound 84 years old. They've never owned a property. There's no benefit to the, C the, the LLC that they think there is. Like there are times it's justifiable if you have partners, hard money, LLC is the way to go. But not that's not the reason most people usually think they need it. Um, you can use your PO box uh, if you want to do it. That's probably the best way so they don't have your physical address, although it's really not that hard to find out where somebody lives. Uh, Oliver, howdy. For all your units that has Schlag keyless locks, do you give your tenants the master key? No, in case the smart lock goes dead. No, the main reason, so I keep the keys. Um, oh, my book's not out yet. It's still in a box. I'm living out of boxes because uh, I just moved. Um, I keep the key taped to the paper that has the master code and the code, uh, current codes in my leather binder that the entire business is in, which is usually supposed to sit right here. Um, but I have two exterior doors on my units that have coded locks. So all of them have at least two doors. I put in two coded locks. The odds of both sets of batteries ever dying at the same time or one of the locks failing at the same time as the other are so astronomically small. I've never seen it in, ever. Um, and until recently, I had um, batteries in my unit for over three years and they just failed about a month ago. So it was a little over three years. That's how long the battery lasts. In my lease, I have that the tenants need to exchange the batteries at least once a year. I provide the first one and one in a drawer to be done the first time. After that, it's tenant's responsibility. One door is going to get used more than the other. So that's the battery that's probably going to fail. And I was using Schlag. I have switched to, I'll, I'll have to put a link up, of the coded locks that Matt was using. And I'm pretty happy with them so far. I, this is my first time testing them. So I want to do like a six-month trial before I say, yeah, these seem to work pretty good so far. Yeah, they were pretty rough on getting in the door, but the Schlag... It's the one I was happy with for a long time. They do cost more than the, I think it's quick set or whatever I'm doing from Matt. TBS 24, howdy. Jay, great scenario. If it goes horrible, it's break even is where I like to be too. Yep. Wealth Building Jenny got off the phone with the agent. Could we talk about traditional loans, FHA and conventional loans, please? Sure. Happy to. And then we'll probably be wrapping up with questions after this. So if you have a quick question you want to get in here towards the end, this is the time to get it in. Um, but FHA versus conventional. So many people, um, Wealth Building Journey, Chester, most people say FHA and they think first time home buyer. And it was Defiant. So Angel R, I have Defiant Locks and Quick Set. He recently switched. So I actually have some of each here that I'm trying. FHA loans are not intended for first-time homebuyers. It's, it's the F and the H. People think first-time homebuyer. It's Federal Housing Authority. FHA is intended for people with bad credit and bad debt-to-income ratio and giving them the ability to still get on the property ladder. That's what FHA is designed for. So people will say, well, if I want to buy a house, it's only 3.5% down, right? Well, if you want to buy a house with a conventional loan and you haven't owned a property for three years, that's only going to be 3%. It's not 
It's not five. It's not 10. It's three for the first one. After you own a property, so if you've owned a property in the last three years, then it's 5%. And that's for house, house with ADU, duplex. You can find some lenders that'll want 10 or 15%, but you can also find lenders who will do 5%. Triplex or fourplex is when the FHA loan can shine because most lenders will want 15 or 20% down on a three or a four unit. But FHA is 3.5 up to four. A VA loan is zero down up to five units. Right? So there's a bunch of numbers throwing around there. Only focus on the one that applies to you. If your credit score is above 620 and your debt to income ratio is below 43, you're probably not going to want to use FHA because the negatives with FHA Sellers are less likely to take the offer because the perception is there's more hoops to jump through. It has to be live-in ready. You can have missing water heater straps and can blow the deal up. So whether it's real or not, the perception is sellers don't want to take FHA loans. Sometimes they don't want to take VA loans either. So easier to get conventional accepted. Mortgage insurance exists on FHA or conventional if you put down less than 20%. With an FHA loan, it lasts the length of the loan meaning it's there forever unless you sell, pay off the mortgage, or refinance. Those are the three times you can get rid of mortgage insurance on FHA. For the conventional loan, mortgage insurance goes away automatically when you have 22% equity, if you put down less than 20 when you start. So you can put down three on your first five. I did a 5% down on my first duplex. A mortgage insurance went away. It, it said automatically, but I would go at 22% contact the seller or the mortgage company and say, hey, I'm getting close to this. When is this going to go away? It goes away without having to refinance. Here's the other negatives. Matt, the lumberjack landlord solved this negative with the FHA loan that the FHA loan is not intended for investors. It's to help somebody with bad credit, bad debt to income ratio, get on the property ladder. That's not an investor. That's a homeowner. So if a lender thinks you're buying a property as an investment, you're not supposed to be able to. So if you purchased a house, and you're going to buy your next one, but that you want to go from a house to a duplex, FHA lenders will often say, you can't do that. You can go from a duplex to a house because they want you to be moving from a multifamily towards a house. So you can go from a four unit to a three unit to a two unit to a one unit. So Matt actually calls his strategy, the four, three, two, one method. It's brilliant. It's a way to use FHA. I think there's a lot of extra steps because you can only have one FHA loan at a time. So use the FHA to buy a fourplex, have to refinance out of it to use the FHA on the triplex, have to refinance out of it to use it on the duplex. So it's, it's a long process. But with 4321, you have 10 rentals, all with FHA loans. Yeah, it took a while, but it's a strategy to always do 3.5% down. So it's a great strategy. I preferred the conventional route. First, for the mortgage insurance. Second, because it's easier to get your offer accepted. And third, because I went from a duplex to a fourplex with a conventional owner-occupied loan, nobody batted an eye. Because conventional loans, even owner-occupied, are okay for investors. So easier to get the offer accepted. Lenders don't care if you're going from four, three, two, one, because the idea is with an FHA, you can go from a four to a one, right? So a four to a three to a two to a one, and then from a one into a bigger one. You can have other justifiable reasons too, like it's closer to work, it's closer to a better school district. I didn't get along with the neighbor. Whatever the reason is for using an FHA, you can have it. You have to do a letter of explanation in LOV saying, here's why I want to use this. There's all these hoops to jump through with an FHA that just don't exist with a conventional. Easier to get accepted. Mortgage insurance goes away automatically. Um, you can house hack. You can house hack in any order. Uh, that's my breakdown on conventional versus FHA. The triplex or fourplex FHA might be the way to go if the down payment is the barrier. I hope that was a good enough breakdown. Uh, Michael, in a crawl space, you okay, wait, there you go, to Michael, so I missed something, Michael. Michael, would you buy a property with a crawl space? Most of mine have crawl spaces. What would you look for that would be a deal breaker? So the current haunted house that I live in, I thought it had a crawl space. I could see the crawl space. And then I found out it had a basement. Because <laughs> I could see when we took the siding off, I could see through the plumbing area that there was a room with a light on and a haunted wheelchair, part of a couch. So I did a live video with Millennial Mike out here where we went down and checked it out. I, doesn't think, I don't think it's livable space. It's more just a place to lock up the gimp. There's a water bowl for the gimp in there and a lock that keeps somebody in. It's weird. Um, 
So I buy properties with crawl spaces. I have crop properties that are on slab. I, I the, Washington is not a basement because basements in Washington turned into unanticipated indoor pools. That's what they're technically called. Uh, mine being a basement on a hill, I don't think I'm going to have that issue. Uh, so yeah, I would. Um, what would be a deal breaker? More work than I want to do. More work than would give me the yield that I want. No parking for the way I want the unit laid out, no washer dryer hookups or the ability to add them in a cost effectively way. So if all the wet walls are in a place where you can't add a washer dryer without running new pipes and spending 10 plus thousand dollars, I probably wouldn't look at that. I have properties with garages, with carports, without garages. So none of that's a deal breaker. I prefer garages, even though carports will rent for more. I'm not looking at the most rent. I'm looking at the lowest tenant turnover, which this garage turns into a storage shed. So much stuff, it means less likely to move. I'm trying to think, what are the other deal breakers that I've ran into? HOA is a deal breaker. Foreclosure is a deal breaker. Short sales is a deal breaker. I don't want my money tied up with lenders over long periods of time. And I don't ever want to own an HOA. Uh, nightmare stories. Random assessments for the deal killers. Boards made up of people who have nothing better than time to mess with their friends and neighbors. Uh, no thanks less appreciation because you lose investors because they don't want to own an HOA either. Legacy OPP and a crawl space you need a vapor barrier. I showed, I was surprised the one here has it in the crawl space area. Also drains to sump pump. It's also important mold inspection as well. So if you have crawl space, most of mine have that. I I don't have any that have sump pump needs and I'm in literally a water state. Uh, I rented a place that had a sump pump for a while when I was starting my journey. Uh, JR, what's your opinion on self-directed retirement accounts to buy real estate? So for some people, it might be the best option, right? I can't say this is good or bad because do you want to retire after 59 and a half when you're too old to enjoy it? Do you want to retire and pay more taxes later because the government's going to raise taxes? If the answer to those two things are yes, you want to do that. But here's the problem with my with self-directed IRAs. One, it's it's still planning on 59 and a half for retirement. Two, you lose the benefits of depreciation. You lose the benefits of house hacking. You lose the benefits of self-managing. Like all of the things that I like the most about real estate aren't there with a self-directed IRA. Uh, doesn't provide you cash flow now. It gives you money to reinvest into your retirement account to help you later. Um, so trying to be as impartial there, there are times it makes sense. Do you plan on retiring after 59 and a half? Do you not want the cash flow now to help you grow your portfolio outside of your retirement account? Do you not need the depreciation? Do you not need, do you not want to self-manage? Like if you take that whole list of pros and cons that I did and you don't care about most of them and you have it, for me, a retirement account, first best use as you're learning to invest is you can use it as a, as a uh, reserve. Lenders will recognize 50% of a retirement account as your reserve because that's what's going to be left after you pay taxes and the penalty to take it out. Second thing is what I did with it, empty it out, right? Contribute for the match, take the money out, put it into a rental property, pay the penalty, pay the taxes. The rental property provides cash flow now, better tax benefits than any retirement account. I can actually carry forward a loss from last year when I had profit. I could carry forward a loss for this year. Can't do that with a retirement account. Um, cash flow now to retire, appreciation, all, all, all of the things outside of that retirement account that owning the property get me. It's, it's so much better than having it self-directed in an IRA. It works for some people, but they have a different goal. I mean, for me, the goal was financial freedom in 10 years or less. If I started at 20, it would have been at 30. I didn't start till 40. So it, the goal was by 50. Did it at 48, worked till 52, retired last year at 52. Couldn't do that if it was in a self-directed IRA. I'd still be working for seven and a half more years. That's a good question though, because that, that's a, topic that comes up and it is a strategy that you can use. Remember, there are three people who benefit from retirement accounts, three groups of people, and none of them are you. Your employer benefits because it's a trick to get you to stay with the company. It is a recruitment and retention tactic. The government, because you're going to pay taxes in the future that are more than what they are now. And the people who manage the accounts make more than you ever will on your retirement account. They make money even if you lose money. Oliver, when tenant moves out, what's your process regarding the deposit? What you deduct and deliver to tenant? 
Um, trying to think if a tenant's ever not got their deposit back. So I've only had the four tenants turn over. So far, they have received the funds. There's one that's going to be moving out eventually. Uh, has young kids, has punched holes in the doors. Several things are broken. I've offered to fix. She said, no, nope, they'll just break them again. So when she moves out, these things will be replaced and I will charge the deposit. So normally my goal is to get the full deposit back to the tenant. That's that's their money. It's there to repair for things they actually broke, not things that wore out, right? Things have a life expectancy. And I've been setting aside 10% of gross rents uh, for repairs and maintenance and 5% for vacancies. 15% of gross rents is factored into fixing those things. So when the tenant moves out, it's really not their job to fix the things that wore out. It's their job to fix the stuff they broke, right? So, so far I've refunded, I want to say 100% of every deposit of the four times that I've had it. One, when the person passed away, I technically could have used the deposit. Um, there was some, some expense I could have covered, but I figured that's a family dealing with loss. You think I'm going to worry about a couple hundred bucks or something? No, I just gave the deposit back. Um, Tenda, thanks for the help. I appreciate your advice. How often do you do these live Zoom chats? Every Tuesday, every Tuesday, 4 p.m. Pacific. I'm trying to think if I've missed one in over um, a year and a half. This is the 84th one or something, whatever was on the thumbnail. Is it on the thumbnail? The 85th one. Um, and there was like three or four before I started numbering them. So every Tuesday, 2 p.m., 4 p.m. Pacific, Matt, the lumberjack landlord, is also brilliant, much smarter than I am. And, and so my, my, my goal is to take the average person and say, you can reach financial freedom in 10 years or less, even if you're not starting from the best position, and say, there are many paths to financial freedom. Here's how you do it. Some, it's growing a business with the goal of getting it so big, somebody else runs the day-to-day. It could be investing in stocks, doing using the the four percent rule, right? The, uh, of investing twenty five times your annual living expenses, and then living off of four percent of the returns or dividend stocks. Then the third way is real estate, and then there, it could be wholesaling, flipping, buy and hold, syndications, REITs, like all the things about real estate. So I'm telling people there's all these ways to do it. That's where my expertise is. I'm not really good at tenant turnover. I'm <laughs> I'm reaching out to Matt like three times a day on this stupid rehab because it's not my skill set. Matt has 137 rentals, been investing over 20 years. And there's interesting sound coming in. Something's probably dying out there. Um, it's the haunted house, right? So technically something's dead in here. But he's got this mountain of knowledge when it comes to how to handle contractors and how to do your rehabs. And right, so, so it's my job to get you in the game, to get you out of the parking lot into the stadium. Um, one rental at a time, Michael Zuber has all the strategies to get you in onto the field. And then Matt takes you on the field. He's actually got a course called, oh, crap, I'm a landlord. Now what? Right. And that's all the stuff. So I actually use his information once you're a landlord. But for me, it's the daily reminder of the mindset of here's how money works. That's what it takes to focus for 10 years because the first five years suck. It goes so slow. It's boring. It's not fast. And then after that five years, this income snowball thing starts to happen and you get this problem where all the money's coming in and you have to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> That's a problem I want you to have. Um, so he does his live streams Sunday morning, 8.30 Pacific. Uh, so if you like live streams, you like questions answered from people who are in the business to reach financial freedom, who aren't selling fear porn, we're not telling you to take action fast. We're not telling you to wait. We're telling you, figure out when you're ready. And here's how you hunt for great deals. And this is how you make work optional. Corby. I see. Here we go. Howdy. He does this weekly. Comes back anytime. Don't miss the Lumberjack Landlords Live on Sundays too. Love it. Laura. Dion, is your umbrella insurance a personal umbrella or a commercial? Personal. I have a personal umbrella and I heard it won't protect my duplex. The, heard from who? Because my fourplex, my triplex, everything that's residential is in my personal umbrella. Listed the addresses as what they are. Uh, so I would check the information source. And then maybe the underwriter that you have, the insurance company has it written a certain way. So you might have to specifically, I went through uh, Geico for most of my insurance through Stillwater. I've got a couple of other ones I don't have memorized. I forget who the umbrella policies with. Uh, but Geico's the starting point. 
Angel R, will you be doing most of the demolition on the Ocean House? Yeah, most of the demo. Uh, I had the siding demoed by a, a company. I'm doing the fun demo when I get to sledgehammer something. That's me. But if it's actual work and carrying and cleaning up, I'm happy to contribute to my local area and employ some people on a job where they can earn some money. And I can be lazy. I hoop hardy. Howdy. Haven't seen you in a while. Glad to see you here. I was actually questioning if I went the wrong route by buying a single family house and house hacking it before buying a multifamily house and housing, but I went conventional. Thanks for that breakdown. Awesome. Yeah. And it's not quite the wrong way. It's the wrong way with FHA, but conventional. I went, I owned a single family, um, moved into an apartment, rented out the house to fix my debt to income ratio uh, for two years and then purchased a duplex. So I went single family duplex. And then from the duplex, I was there years and then bought the fourplex. Roderick, howdy, just curious, how many units do you have? Currently, I have 18, but only 16 are rental units. I just purchased a self-funded house hack bird duplex. So if you get the terminology, we got that. Um, that's the other units vacant, but it was a cash purchase, so it's self-funded, That even the rehab is self-funded. Uh, that's not something I would do in year one to year 10, but I'm in year 12, financially free and retired. Um, so I've, I've had 16 rental units. Now I have 18, but 16 are rentals. They, they generate a little over $17,000 a month in pure cash flow. That's why I was able to retire last year. It cost me about $4,000 a month to live because um, I house hacks. So why keep that low? And I travel to countries like Thailand and Colombia. So I'm not going to super expensive places when I'm out of the country. Um, so $17,000 a month was plenty for me to be not only financially independent, but which is work is optional, but financially free where I don't really look at price tags. I mean, I don't do stupid stuff, go buy a new RV every couple of months and a new boat and ever afford to go on a date because nobody could do that. But um, retired with 16, just out of this new duplex. Dividend day, 401ks in Admiral Akbar's voice. It's a trap. Yeah, I'm not good at uh, making a racist um, Asian tone like Akbar did. Great character, but a bit of a stretch. Art T, howdy. So if a tenant is making holes in doors and walls, isn't that a violation of your lease? <laughs> I don't care. I don't live there. It is a violation of the lease. I could take action if I wanted to, but the tenants living there, they've got kids. I only have three units right now that have kids. Um, outside looks good. That I would be concerned about, right? Uh, but the inside... I'll, if I fix it now, it's money from the tenant or the tenant's deposit. When they move out, it's money from the tenant's deposit. Doors aren't that expensive, right? A couple hundred bucks. And there's a, I think it's a $1,700 deposit or $2,000. I forget what it was. It's, they, they've been in there since 2016, I think. Um, so it is a violation of the lease, but I don't care about a lot of violations of lease. If it impacts me or if it impacts other tenants or neighbors, sure, I'd care. But inside, <laughs> rent's paid on time. I don't get called for trivial things. I've never had a complaint from a neighbor. Those are the things I matter. Those are the things that matter to me. People have different goals. Rainy, the last three jobs I worked, I never did anything with the retirement account offered to me besides pay to it, pay into it. Yep. Is there a way to get it out and use it towards a property or even roll it into my current one? So some of them, employers, you work for the state now, they should have a way where you can roll the old accounts into it. If you don't own a house, Rainy, I think most employer, most systems will let you take $15,000 out towards the purchase of your first house. I believe that's all residential. So more towards fourplex, triplex, duplex, house with ADU, single family house. So you can take, do that. I took the money out, paid the penalty, paid the taxes, bought a triplex. That's not true. I took the money out in 2020 when there was no penalty for COVID, bought a triplex. This year, since you you know I worked at CDS, the truck driving school, and retired last year, this year I have no W-2 income, so I just emptied out the remaining what was left in my account, put that into this purchase, paid the penalty. I don't think I'll have any taxes because I don't have any W-2 income, and my depreciation schedule on these properties is going to mean all of my income that comes in is on the passive side, uh, and I carried forward a loss, and I will carry forward a loss this year. JMC, howdy. Question, have you experienced analysis paralysis? How do you confront it and overcome it? I have analysis paralysis when it comes to a social interaction. I confront it by talking to a camera. 
works pretty good. Um, first, I want to point out autocorrect always changes my name the way you spelt it to D E O N. So if you're if you're trying to go to like deontalk.com, sign up for the free binder course to learn how to have your tenants raise their own rent or consultation hour or sign up for my actual course on financial freedom for the lazy person, it's D I O N. If you're using Hemlane, you can get 20% off the first year by using Dion Talk, but it's D I O N that doesn't show up because autocorrect always puts it to D E. Um, or sometimes it adds an E at the end. Um, I'm not black and I'm not a female. So the other ways of spelling it are different. Uh, D-I-O-N, um, my parents had a reason for it. But the real reason is because they weren't very creative. And all of my siblings, uh, 13, uh, are Ds. Debbie, Dina, David, Dale, Dion. So it's like this list of Ds to, to have your name. I think I was what was left. How do I confront analysis paralysis? <clears throat> Four words. Okay, this is this is note taking time. Teacher, military stamping on the floor. It'll be on the test. Trying to never give more than three points in a in a presentation because people can retain three. So if you're going to do more than three, make a point that they need to take a note because the average mind can retain three things when you're teaching. When you get to the fourth, you don't lose the fourth. You lose all four. So here's the thing that's beyond the three that I've tried to teach in this video. Four words to get past analysis paralysis. Confidence comes from competence. When you build competence at a skill, it will make sense to go to the next step. So this is kind of out of the course, but the Cliff Notes version. There are six steps to getting started in real estate. Step one is learning how to save. Saving doesn't mean spending less. It means making more, right? Increasing income while trying to decrease expenses. You can only decrease expenses 100%. So you can only save 100% of what you make, but there's no limit to how much of an increase you can do. Side hustle, overtime, learn a skill to be more attractive to your employer to get more money, get a promotion. Change companies is actually a way to make more money. In most situations now, you'll make more money by changing companies. So that's step one. When you get good at increasing your income and decreasing your expenses, Maybe you need to budget. Maybe I, I, I've never done a budget, never going to do a budget. So I house hacked, got rid of that largest expense. I got good with my finances. Competence, right? Confidence came from competence. I got good at saving, so I was confident. So now that I'm confident, at, I know how to save. I should look at my credit score. That's step two. You want to have a credit score above 740, and you want it well above 740 because the credit score that we see isn't the same credit score that lenders are going to see. So what does it take to build your credit? Credit longevity, uh, credit utilization, keeping it below 10%. The more you study your credit score, the more competent you get in the idea of credit, the more confident you are to take the steps to improve your credit score, which if you have the ability to save and you have a pretty good credit score, it makes sense to go to step three, right? Confidence comes from competence. Now that I'm confident, competent at these things, I'm confident that I'm going to go talk to a lender. I'm not going to sound like an idiot. I know what my credit score is. I know how much I can make. I know how much I can save. I know what my expenses are. I'm competent in these skills, so I'm confident to go to the next thing. Now that I can talk to a lender, I know what my, my options are. I know what I can borrow, what I would need to change. I actually found out I couldn't borrow anything unless I had rental income on my tax returns. That's why I moved from my house into an apartment and rented it out for two years to get rental income on my tax returns. And now I can buy almost anything as long as I had the down payment. So that's the Cliff Notes version. That's how you get past analysis paralysis. You get competent at the step you're in so that you have the confidence and it'll push you to the next step all the way through all six steps to reaching financial freedom. That was a good question. Thank you. And I'm probably going to be wrapping up here soon. Uh, yeah, the, I think I have like two minutes and the appraisers, uh, not appraiser, architect is supposed to be here. Um, so for two questions, let me see what else I can get to. Get an accountability buddy. Yeah, I love that too. JMC, you take small but consistent action. I've been stuck in analysis process. We were working on that. Um, Chester's actually in the course. We're working on the steps. You did a big step this last week. I appreciate that. Uh, I have a triplex still learning the process, and all of your YouTube videos are really helpful. Continue to good work. Sure. And this is to everybody, not just you. My email is in the chat. Happy to answer questions you're not comfortable asking in a public format. So if you have something you want to ask, but you don't want people to know it's you, ask there. I will. Do my best to answer. And if I ever miss, like it's been a day, send it again, because I get a lot of emails, I might miss it. Um, you might ask a question 
that I then make a video out of, but I don't put your name in it. Right? And I don't even talk about your market, where you're at or anything. It might be a good question. And I was like, oh, other people would want to know this too. But always feel free to email me. Uh, and you are not lazy. You're just hard to work smart, not hard. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Last question. Dave K. Howdy. Would you suggest larger down payments so the first five years don't suck? Already retired, did it the hard way, W-2 in stocks, wanting to diversify. I like that you did it and you're 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 already retired, now diversify. Right? The mistake a lot of people make is I really want to be diversified. I've heard Warren Buffett say, I've heard Kevin O'Leary say, you want 20% as a maximum in any asset class, 5% in any asset, and like you're so diversified, right? And then Charlie Munger says, Warren's partner. You focus on one asset class to become wealthy. Once you're wealthy, now you diversify to protect the wealth. So I like that you did it. Your so real estate, stocks, business, crypto, whatever your thing is, only homes. I don't care. To get wealthy, you focus on that one, and then once you're there, now it's the time to diversify. I diversify by having small multifamily properties more than ten miles apart next to several economic drivers. I diversify my tenant base by having one-third military, one-third Section 8, and one-third working or retired. Right? I've diversified inside my asset class. So in stocks, you're probably index fund. I'm not going to assume anything. You probably have diversified in stocks. If you were confident enough to retire, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't just have like everything's in Amazon or Tesla because one tweet from Elon can screw that up. But if you want to diversify into real estate, I... Uh, the way I did it is I believe, and I talk, I probably say this too much. I think the power of house hacking is phenomenal. It's it's the reason why I was able to go from such a bad position to financially free in you know a decade. You don't have to house hack. I'm gonna make a video later this week of the three things that change when you take house hacking out of the equation. So if you can't house hack for whatever reason, because you don't want to, because everyone is possibly able to house hack. I did it with young kids. As a single parent. So other than maybe a major health concern, I can't think of any other reason why I couldn't have house hacked. I don't know that I would do a larger down payment more than 25%. Uh, the power of real estate is leverage, right? Getting four times the appreciation on what you invested, getting tenants to pay it off, getting the full depreciation benefit of properties worth more than what your down payment can be. So I generally, when growing, don't recommend buying cash. I just purchased a property all in cash. So we need that cognitive dissonance to kick in and go, when I'm talking about growing a portfolio, house hacking is very important. Leverage is very important. When we are stabilizing and investing for other reasons than growth, that's a very different scenario. In your situation, I still probably wouldn't go above 25% down. House hacking does do two things, though. It gets you the better interest rate. It does three things. Better Interest rate, owner-occupied lending is better than, than the other loans. Second is it gets you a lower down payment, so higher leverage. You might not want that in your position if you're looking at money to deploy. And the third thing is it lowers your housing costs. Lowering your housing costs makes retirement easier. Um, and that will be the question that I wrap up with for the week. Um, and uh, But uh, I struggle. On stopping and that's the ferry and that means the yep, foot ferry will be landing uh jmc thanks for the golden nuggets thank you beth traverso howdy beth you guys should check out beth at beth traverso group.com um she's been on the channel a couple times she is a an investor with more experience a larger portfolio and the real estate side like i'm not an agent actually i have a list of reasons why i'm not an agent she's got the both sides of the spectrum there to answer questions Good to see you here, Beth. And then I'll wrap up really quick questions here for Chenda because I was I was wrapping up. Were you stressed in the beginning of your landlording journey? I was stressed before I started because of a sentence that my brother said. Ask me that question next week and I'll answer it. What did my brother say that stopped me from investing for a decade? Um, or were you always this stress-free and confident? So in investing or running a truck driving school or working in law enforcement, um, I'm not sure which was harder. So I joined the Marine Corps, went to combat, right? So a combat veteran. In, in real estate so far, while somebody did shoot my property while I was in Indiana, somebody shot my property. I haven't been shot at yet. 
I haven't had a gun pulled on me in real estate yet. Uh, there's there's no stress in real estate like the, and you could die in the next couple of minutes because of what's happening. So that stress is very easy to handle. I think the stress of being a single parent <laughs> is way worse than all of that. So I think if you've raised kids, uh, if you've had a stressful job, I think you can stress yourself out in real estate. You can make it worse than it is. We mitigate risk, right? It's it's everything in real estate is going to seem scary the first time. The second time, it's going to feel like you could teach a class. So we want to mitigate risk. We want to study before we take action. We're never going to know everything. So we want to get to about 80% of what we think we need to know and then take action. That helps with the stress. Insurance in place. Being ethical. Uh, educating yourself before you take action is huge, right? My, my first year was kind of a nightmare because I wasn't educated. I rented to a friend with a handshake. Can't trust a stranger, right? So why rent to them? Didn't need a lease. It was a friend. Like everything that you could do wrong, I did wrong because I was uneducated. So if you're educating yourself before you take action, a lot of the stress has got to go away. Your stress will change. The, the first stress, once you learn a market, pick the strategy and start making offers, your biggest stress is going to be, I hope my offer is good enough. I hope they take it, right? Did I do enough? Did I do enough earnest money? Did I give enough timeline? What can I have done to make my offer more attractive, right? And then that stress switches to, oh, crap, what if they take my offer? Now I've got to pay for an appraisal, pay for an inspection, actually decide if I want the property. I got to meet tenants. I got to find leases. I got to just stress just changes, right? And then you buy a property and you're like, wow, there's a whole legal system backing up this lease. I'll stand up to my side. The system is there to help the tenants want to stand up to their side. There are, is YouTube University to figure out the answer to almost any question. There's people like Zuber, Matt the Lumberjack Landlord, Millennial Mike, me, Beth, who will actually answer questions when you email us to take away all of that stress. So I'm going to wrap this live up there. I hope everybody's had a great Tuesday evening with me. I look forward to seeing you all next week for my next live stream. I know Dave was expecting a dad joke there, but thank you all very much for hanging out with me tonight. It's been awesome. These are some great questions and I appreciate each and every question. Um, if you think my content earned it, maybe hit the like button on your way out. That'd be really cool. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk.